Spurge here to welcome you back to another exciting episode of High Side, Low Side. I am joined, of course, by Zach Quartz. And if you are following along in New Miracle Order, this is episode 10 of season six. And today we have a Not the News segment really focused on the fact that it's going to be a new year. Our discussion is going to focus on motorcycle gear. We've got our expert Pat McHugh joining us. He's going to play some Rev Trivia, the motorcycle engine sound guessing game. We've also got a t-shirt winner for the individual that gave us the best podcast review, as well as some listeners' comments that Zach and I are going to read out loud, highlighting some of our favorite comments of the past few weeks. But before we do any of that, Zach, let's get in a word from our sponsor, Motul. Yes, indeed. Uh, As some of you may know, Motul makes many products for uh, the two-wheeled lifestyle. Engine oil, chain care kits, helmet clean, brake fluid, the list goes on. You could buy these products from other companies if you wanted to. But as a high side, low side listener, what you would not be doing if you purchased products other than Motul is supporting high side, low side. So next time you need any products such as those, do check out revzilla.com slash Motul to shop Motul products and support high side, low side. That's revzilla.com slash Motul, M-O-T-U-L. And while you're on RevZilla.com, make sure you check out RevZilla.com slash RPM. Perhaps you didn't get what you wanted this holiday season and you (laughs) need to do some shopping on your own. By joining RevZilla's RPM program, you get extra discounts on exclusive brands as well as $15 cash back and 5% cash back in RPM bucks. There's plenty of extra discounts to be had that can help you buy a few extra items that maybe you're best loved one just didn't give you this holiday season and you want to treat yourself. So if you haven't already done so, check out revzilla.com slash RPM for more information. But with that, let's start the podcast. Okie dokie, everybody. Episode 10 of season six. We are uh, going to jump right in with not the news. And not only is it not the news, it's not even not the news news this time around spurge we are uh listing this episode ready for your listening pleasure on 12 31 22 which means it is the end of the year and the beginning of the year at the same time depending on when you're listening to this <laughs> so uh instead of news spurge and i are going to reflect a little bit um we are going to make uh, one resolution and one prediction for 2023. It can be high side, low side based or uh, or life based. Perhaps Spurge has always wanted to um, shave his facial hair into a goatee and yet this year's the year. I, I won't say. I'll let him say. I mean, I could do a Fu Manchu mustache for the next episode <laughs> if that's what we want to do. I'm willing to make that sacrifice for the team. Um Actually, no, I won't do that because of the way this is all working out, I, I can't have a Gear Guides Fu Manchu. I think my boss will come down on me pretty hard if I do that. So, anywho, um, I, I would like to say that I've been doing some research, and, and normally I'm the positive uh, outlier when it comes to Common Tread um, and our little group of ragtag journalists that we have here, um, and I use that term very loosely. Um, but what, what do you mean positive outlier? I am normally the person that colors everything with rose glasses. So like the motorcycle industry is going <laughs> to grow by 10% and like everybody's going to get into motorcycling see, see. and uh-huh. yada, yada, yada. So I am going to say that I predict for 2023 a decline in motorcycle sales. I mean, it's been oh. a, a banner couple of years, but I think 2023 is going to be a year for motorcycle deals. So if you're looking at getting into motorcycling or perhaps you're thinking about buying a motorcycle, I think you're going to see a real cooling off of prices in the used market. And for anyone trying to shop for a used motorcycle or a new motorcycle over the past few years has known it's it's hard because prices are at an all-time high um, and motorcycle inventory is hard to come by. And I think as we look at where we're at uh, economically, I think that as we think about 2023, if you've held off on buying a motorcycle up until now and you've been waiting for a deal to come along, I'm going to predict that 2023 is your year. Wow. Okay. Well, that's uh, I, I, that's an interesting prediction. And like you said, a bit pessimistic for such a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed fellow such as yourself, Spurgeon. My prediction is um, not to do so much with the industry overall, but um, I, I wanted to make a prediction that we would talk about how uh, a brand didn't have any new models like we did with Suzuki, and then they would come out with more new models like Suzuki did, just because that was sort of a fun and strange bit of timing. But... I think uh, that you, Spurgeon Dunbar, or or me, Zach Quartz, will ride a 
hybrid motorcycle in 2023. A, a gasoline electric motorcycle. It'll happen. Finally. I'm, I'm actually and, and, and really it's not quite that. a turbo. I know, and not quite a not quite a turbo bike like I've been looking for and excited about for quite some time. But I think hybrid technology is obviously running rampant in the automotive industry, and I think it's intriguing in the two wheeled world. And I think 2023 is the year. It was funny that you brought up turbo because I was doing uh, Instagram <laughs> Live the other day on Revzilla's channel, and somebody was like, "All right, so we know that you and Zach both want to put a turbo on a Hayabusa, but if you had to put a turbo <laughs> on anything else," and I was like. When will this die? When are we going to keep talking? We keep talking about turbos. And I was like, you know, Zach Quartz is the one that's the fan of the turbos, not me. Yeah, He's yeah. all about the turbo. True, true, true. Um, okay, so so your resolution, Spurge. So my resolution is going to tie right into the prediction. Um, I resolve that I am not going to buy another motorcycle in 2023. Um, I was one of the ones that went out and bought a used motorcycle uh, in 2022 <laughs> and I paid a premium for it and I'm gonna I'm gonna feel that uh, I'm guessing in 2023 when the prices start to come down but I am resolving that I am not buying another motorcycle for at least the next year that is my resolution okay so no moto purchases for Spurge mm -mm. in 2023 we'll see if I can hold to that <laughs> all right well my resolution for what it's worth, is to ride more. And, you know, that sounds silly, being that I'm the, the the host of Daily Rider, my whole thing is I ride to work every day. But the truth is, I find myself in my Daily Rider loop a lot. You know, I ride to work on a bike, it's, it's what I'm working on, and then I got another one coming in in a couple weeks, and it's a very spoiled lifestyle that I live in. I feel fortunate to test so many different motorcycles. But I, I neglect often uh, going to a go-kart track for a little mini moto track day or going to a full-size track for an actual track day or taking a dirt bike out on some trails and riding around just for the sake of enjoying it so that's my resolution for for 2023 is to kind of um is to uh still work hard but play harder well i, I know we we did we missed you we missed you in 2022 at the sturgis get on adventure fest because you got you got the covid and got the we would that, yep. that would that would have been like six days of off-road riding straight for you I know. And I did the other Get On Adventure Fest earlier in the year and I had a blast. So yeah. hopefully I'll get to do uh, all the Get On Adventure Fests of 2023. Well, it sounds like you're going to kick off your resolution uh, on a positive note because I believe you're going to the racetrack tomorrow. Are you not? I am. Yeah. Uh, and granted, this is uh, we're still we're recording this in 2022. So it, my my. Um, you know, my resolution has not come, uh, you know, come come to fruition in 2023 yet. But yes, I'm I'm ramping up. You might say, I'm moving right. in the right direction. Well, hopefully that comes true for you. I'd like to see you out there riding more. And uh, speaking of of riding more, our guest today <laughs> is Pat McHugh, who is a, a heck of a rider. He is a Revzilla teammate here on the media side of things, and he is someone that is a uh, a bit of an expert in the world of motorcycling gear, which is going to tie into what our topic is for today's episode. So without any further ado, let's get Pat McHugh onto the podcast today. And we are going to spend some time with him talking about motorcycle gear. Yes, indeed. All right. So welcome, Pat McHugh, to your first episode of High Side, Low Side. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, first time, <laughs> long time. Uh, awesome to join you guys. <laughs> right on, man. Yeah. Well, we're stoked to have you on the cast because we like talking about bikes with you, but also we feel like you've got lots of... Um, gear knowledge to drop on people, being that you are the gear guru here at Revzilla. So uh, as is tradition here on High Side Lowside, we're going to start with a lightning round of questions that we have not shared with you, as you are well aware. That's fun. Don't worry, they're going to be easy to answer. Um, the first one is, how did you get into motorcycling and what was your first bike? Ooh, so I, I have the opposite childhood that you had zach where i grew up and bikes were a hundred percent no in my household okay so interesting i, interesting, I yep. couldn't own a bike until i got to 18 but i had a lot of friends that rode dirt bikes so occasionally okay. we'd sneak over to their house and uh follow every law in the local parks and everything like that you know definitely not break any laws um, but we would ride around uh, some 250s 125s things like that and have fun and then as soon as i graduated from high school i started shopping for a bike and then i, I waited about two years two three years and i bought a uh an old Honda 599 Hornet down in uh, when nice. it was, I bought it in Virginia, but made it all the way back to Pennsylvania. And then my mom found out about it. So I sold it 
to a friend. Uh, uh, <laughs> for, for, those, for those her. of you, for those of you listening, Pat's using air quotes. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> and I think my my mother might be listening as well. So I, I apologize <laughs> about that. That might be the first time she heard about that. But I sold it to a friend, picked it back up um, later on down the road, and yeah, that was my first bike. That and I had that uh, probably up until I started here at Revzilla about eight years ago, and then I sold nice. it for uh, for a street triple. Yeah. Wow. All right. So. Yeah. Pat, I, I, it's yeah. For those of you listening that that aren't familiar, Pat has been working uh, alongside myself for uh, probably a little over eight years at this point, and he's the guy behind the scenes that's really helping us with, you know, going through and analyzing every piece of product that comes through, um, you know, from a motorcycle apparel standpoint. So, Pat, how do you spend? You know, knowing that you get your hands on all this different gear and, and you have different bikes in your garage now because your your mother no longer controls how many motorcycles you own. Um, <laughs> h- how do you spend the majority of your time riding these days? Uh, so th- primarily I was a street rider and then the pandemic hit and my commuting kind of went down to very minimal times. Or at least when I was coming into the office, I was carrying boxes back and forth. So I had to switch over to car, but I primarily ride off road. Uh, at this point, I'm usually racing hair scrambles every weekend, or I'm at the MX track when I can sneak out of work or uh, or on the weekends <laughs> try to get out there. So primarily off road right now, and I'd say occasionally like one or two days a week I'll get out on the street bike still. Well, the beauty of working at Revzilla is you're never sneaking out of work when you're riding yeah. motorcycles. You're just logging more hours, and I'm using That's a bunch right. of air quotes right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm always I'm always testing something out and always have an excuse to get out and ride. But I've been very fortunate to be working here and working in the industry that riding is technically work, so I can kind of right. pop out whenever I need to. Well, on that topic, uh, uh, how did you, what was your, what's your, um, your career path? Like what was your, uh, did you, you didn't start out in the motor industry. So what did you, what, what did you used to do and how did you get into the industry? Absolutely. No, I did not start in the industry. I, uh, I went to college and became a, uh, a federal background investigator down in DC. Um, realized after about a year how bad of a mistake that was uh, just for the career path and my likes and dislikes. But what I turned into was riding every night was my zen. You know, going out and riding around D.C. was uh, was how I got away from work, um, how I got away from all the thoughts of what was going on. And I just happened to be shopping with Revzilla one day, called in customer service, had an amazing, amazing experience, um, <laughs> saw an open position and ended up throwing everything I went to college away just to help work in customer service here at Revzilla. I got to move back to my hometown. Uh, and everything. So it, it was it was an interesting path, one that, uh, again, going back to my mother, probably gave her a heart attack when I told her what <laughs> I was doing and the career choice to move into motorcycles from the household I grew up in. But uh, as soon as I interviewed at Revzilla, I knew I 100% wanted to work here. So that was, um, yeah, probably a little over eight years ago, Spurge. It was right after you started. So it was, I think it was like eight, eight and a half years ago at this point. Yeah, because I'm I'm over nine at this point. But yeah, I can I can imagine like the the conversation with your parents being like, listen, so I have a job working for the federal government, which I'm pretty much guaranteed to be okay for the rest of my life. But I'm going to leave that behind, and I'm going to go, you know, work for this motorcycle uh, startup. No, no, we're good. It's it's <laughs> yeah. super super smart. Um, so with your job now, Pat, what would you say? What's one of the biggest challenges of your job as it as it is right now? And maybe maybe a little bit of a of a thirty second explanation as to what your day to day looks like um, for your current position. Yeah, and I I always explain to people what I do, and I've gotten very good at explaining it because the 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 career doesn't really exist outside of a few retailers in the industry. Because at this point, my technical title is gear expert and tester. So <laughs> essentially, my my day to day is grabbing as many products as I can and getting out and putting together outlines and things like that to teach everybody about the product so that our entire company can be pretty knowledgeable on everything that we speak towards. Um, and also helping, I'd say, the industry make a good change. From time to time, suggestions get taken through if it's something is like, hey, while that's a great theory on paper, you know, in reality, it's not the best of features. So my day-to-day is just here, pretty much in my laptop, making notes, testing things out, going out, trying to ride around the parking lot, ride around, do my hour-long commute, and uh, just get out and ride as much as I can really with the, with as many products as you see on the Revzilla YouTube channel. And then what's your biggest challenge? <laughs> Finding the time to ride. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot. It, it's funny. I, I thought riding all the time would be fantastic and it hundred percent is, but I think once you start getting to the point where you start a family, where as you always joke, I start having a little farm going at my house. Once you get to a certain point where you have all these responsibilities, finding more and more time to get out and ride. Whereas before, I'd go out right after work and I'd be riding for two, three hours and come home. Now I have animals to take care of. I have my wife and everything like that that we have to figure out, you know, all the family plans. So that's the time is the hardest thing nowadays. Yeah, it's funny. It's a it's a difficult thing to complain about because people who don't work in, in the motorcycle industry think that it's just 
absurd and insulting to say like, oh, I can't find time to ride. Oh, it must be so tough for you. You can't find time to ride. But it's funny how it feels like a luxury, right? Like, because when you go on a motorcycle ride, it's usually fun. You know, I mean, you you sort of, you you find yourself looking forward to it, but there's almost like a, there's almost like a, a yeah, it feels like a luxury that you can afford to avoid. And, and there's like a guilt almost where you're like, well, I don't need to do that. You know, like technically, like I could do, I could do some more work on that spreadsheet or whatever, even though that's the thing that you have to do in order to fill out the spreadsheet to begin with. Well, yeah, I, I think, I think even finding time to ride for yourself, right? Oftentimes, Absolutely. A, lot of, yeah, a lot of the riding that we do is tied into work in some ways, which is great. And, and that's an amazing way that we all get to make a living. Um, but just being able to go out and ride with your friends and not think about it and, and get back to it, I think, is yeah. probably a challenge. So, so with, okay, you want to take the last one? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So the, um, the last question we have, uh, is about your longest and best motorcycle trip. You know, you're not so much a touring guy, but do you have a, do you have an epic motorcycle adventure on your resume that you're particularly proud of or reflect fondly upon? I, I have, I have a few actually. So for a while there, I, it well, was, we're um, going to need you to pick one. So don't get <laughs> carried away, Pat. So the year was 2000. No, uh, um, a few years ago, I did take a trip from Philadelphia down to Austin to watch MotoGP. And it was, uh, you know, we couldn't get much time off because, you know, I was still working in customer service. We still had responsibilities come back. I had my family to take care of, but we rode down and back. I think it was two days there, two days back. And one of those trips on the way back was pouring rain. I think Spurgeon, you took that trip back, I think on the street twin or the street cup. Oh yeah. Um, street yeah. Twin. So, yeah, that was not a fun ride back from Texas all the way to here. I think it was like, I don't know, what, 1,400 miles or so? Um, and it was like 750 miles a day, and each day was pouring rain in April getting back to the Northeast. So it was one of those really miserable experiences that you're like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. But then a year later, you're like, God, I could go down there. I could do it again. <laughs> nice, yeah. uh, so that that's definitely top of the list still so far. Word, that that's was, awesome, um, man. That was, yeah, like probably 2016, something like that. So a good, a good race to watch. Yeah, right on, right on. Well, there you to have me, it. High side, just, low side. I would say, just audience. to be clear, I didn't ride with Pat. Uh, Pat no, rode. Pat rode by himself, and I rode by myself. I don't want anyone out there to start thinking that Pat and I are riding cross country together. My God. Yeah, we wouldn't want no. that. Wait, yeah. why wouldn't we want that? No, just just around New Jersey. We don't go cross country. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, that's 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 uh, that's good. Back. In fact, I learned a couple things about you. I didn't know about the whole federal background <laughs> investigator in DC. Yeah, that one usually about. surprises people. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty know. laid back. I don't like getting dressed up, and it's because yeah. I did an entire year wearing a suit every single day, working at the Pentagon, working at Dang. other places. So that's it's, funny. it's a different different lifestyle. Well, see, high side, low side is enlightening for me as well. We worked together for a few years now, and I didn't even know that about you. So, um, okay, so Mr. Pat McHugh, that you, the high side, low side audience, know quite well now. Um, is here to talk about gear and um, sort of ratings, testings, what to think about when you when you buy gear, when you put on gear, stuff like that. Um, but we do have a disclaimer to to start this podcast with. Spurge, would you like to take that one? The disclaimer for this podcast is that our buddy Pat McHugh is here to uh, help us talk about gear in a conversational sense. Um, but we're we're not going to do is we're not going to just interview Pat and just sit here and regurgitate uh, what a CE AA rating means and like how long you can slide for. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of acknowledge some of these these definitions of, of, of what these things are. But then we want to get into beyond just a rating and, and really things you should look for, things you should look out for, uh, our individual little beliefs on like what is right and what is wrong and and maybe not even what's right or what's wrong, but like how we, you know, approach motorcycle gear, because I think we're all probably a little bit different. We all probably uh, have uh, some unique thoughts on this stuff that goes beyond um, just what a, a rating can tell you. Right. Does that sound right, about right? right? right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, long, long story short, we would like to educate as much as we can about uh, gear things, but this is not meant to be a comprehensive discussion of every single rating, testing model, et cetera, uh, for every single piece of gear in the world. Hopefully these are practical anecdotes that help, um, you, the audience understand this stuff a little bit better and know what to use in the, yeah. in your, in your writing situation. It's I feel all- like that's uh, the people at home should know that that's a disclaimer to stop me from talking endlessly about these topics <laughs> well, because that's, I that's could go, every it. topic I could go into for a few hours and I think everyone in this room has been in those meetings with me where I'm just told to shut up at a certain <laughs> point. So just explaining why that disclaimer might exist. So uh, 
so so to kick it off, I think um, this was producer Chase's idea, and I think it's a good one. Let's start with uh, each of us naming a time when when gear saved our bacon, right? That we I'm sure we each have a time when we thought like, man, that was a that was a situation I, I got in on a motorcycle and having gear was pretty crucial. And, and I think guest honors, right? Guest honors, absolutely. So so Pat McHugh, can you think of a time uh, aside from your rainy ride across half the United States when uh, when um, your bacon was saved? From gear, yeah. I mean, every weekend racing hair scramble. I'm not for, for everybody at home. I'm a C class bet. Uh, I'm not very fast, and I crash into a lot of trees from weekend to weekend. But um, I mean, this past year, even in this past race season, I think I took a couple branches to the face, uh, where the goggles definitely saved my eyes, and I even went over the bars a few times and hit my chest protector right on my rib cage. And I think it was I had a bruise, but I didn't have a broken rib. So yeah. um, off road crashing happens a lot and a lot for me uh, to emphasize that. So I mean, <laughs> couple couple crashes this year, but definitely any eye protection is, has been key this past year for me. That's a good call out. I like that. Spurge, uh, I think off road riding is the EV, is the obvious one, and and I and I feel like Pat has has already hit that, but I, I would just like to. Second, the fact that you know wearing gear for off-road riding gets used a lot more than my gear on the road, thankfully. Um, but the example that I wanted to use was my 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 first track crash. Right, I think oftentimes we go to the racetrack, and this is like street racing, not motocross racing. Um, and for for years, I, I would go with you know the leather suits and the helmets and the back protectors, and <laughs> and luckily I never had to use it. And uh, a few years ago. I was uh, testing a Ninja 400, and we had just prepped the bike for track use and put an Olin suspension on it and Woodcraft racing parts and all, all this great stuff. And I was excited. I was overzealous. And oftentimes, I, I say to people, I'm like, go out and just take it easy the first lap or the first mm. session and like mm. ease into your day. Don't go out yep, there. Yep. And I was out on cold tires on a cold track on early morning session and first lap around, warm-up lap. I was going through the chicane on the back end of uh, Thunderbolt at uh, NJMP, if anybody out there listening is familiar. And I came through the little chicane and I, and I went left and I just lost the front end completely. Um, and it was like, it was, I'm snapping my fingers. If you can't hear it, sometimes our microphones don't pick it up. But if you're listening, I'm snapping my fingers. And it was like night and day, I was on the ground and sliding. Uh, and I walked up, I, I, I stood up, I walked away and I had no injuries to speak of. And I actually repaired the bike and, and rode the rest of the, the day. There you go. Um, so track, Good track, stuff. track gear saved my bacon. Yeah. Zach? I mean, well, track gear has saved my bacon so many times. I mean, I, 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 I road raced for, for a long time and still do occasionally. And, um, yeah, I mean, basically every crash I've ever had, I was super thankful to have that stuff on. I mean, and I, and I, I think, it's interesting when you think about those crashes as, as sort of benign as yours seemed, Spurge, and, and I've had similar ones where, you know, you just, you fall off and you slide and you get up and everything's totally fine. You go on with your day. It's like, it's almost literally like nothing ever happened. Um, and if you were, if you were wearing shorts and a t-shirt, you'd be in the hospital for a week, you know? Um, and it, and it's, you almost take it for granted, you know? Um, I've just, I don't ever ride, especially not on a track. I don't ever ride without full gear and, and sort of. Um, it's just incredible what you are used to getting uh, away with, you know. Yeah. Um, the example I was going to use though is actually a street crash where I was on a ride with a couple friends, and um, we were going. It was sort of an ADV ride. Went out of this paved road, and we were looking for dirt trails. And we got in a situation where the lead rider like brake checked the second rider, and I was the third rider. And I, I, to avoid smashing into the back of my buddy, I swerved and I had shut off the ABS, the rear ABS on the ADV bike I was on and I got jumped on the rear brake and I slid out and I, I crashed. I, the bike slid off into a ditch and I slid off almost into the ditch. Um, and in the end we picked the bike up and it was okay. Uh, and that was a situation where I was wearing pretty, I mean, I wasn't wearing like ultra kitted expensive gear. I think I was wearing actually a pair of, um, overpants, you know, like a textile overpants that you would put on over jeans that have, uh, some abrasion resistance and they have like a little bit of knee armor or whatever. And then you zip down the sides and, and they're just sort of a, a, a protective layer over your regular pants. Yep. Uh, and then I was wearing kind of benign, regular touring boots, nothing special, nothing with crazy exoskeletal armor or anything like that. But yeah, I just slid down the road and I, and I, you know, I scuffed my hand and I, and I scuffed my pants and my boots, but I got up and rode the rest of the day. No big deal. And again, it's one of those situations where you know, even if you were just wearing a little bit less gear, it could have been so much worse. 100%. I feel like, 
I feel like both of you are big league me with these stories. I mean, Spurgeon was going extremely fast at the track. You were going pretty fast <laughs> on the road. I'm, no, no, I'm no, just no, running no. into branches off of the trail. <laughs> I, I, I said I was at the racetrack. I never said I was going extremely fast. I yeah. think I, I think it was probably like 40 miles an hour low sliding through the chicane. So yeah. you don't have to be going fast to lose the front end. Um, but yeah, so I think that's a great little setup that obviously, you know, and, and Pat, I think you, you hit this right out of the gate. The three of us have crashed more than once. And if you take away nothing <laughs> from this episode, I think a lot of times we talk to people and especially newer riders that have never crashed a motorcycle before. And there's a lot of inherent fear around that. Understandably. I mean, motorcycle crashing can go really, really awry and really wrong. Um, but by wearing the right gear, you can you can oftentimes you know uh, help to circumnavigate some of that risk and, and help to make sure that you get up and you you walk away to crash again another day, and I think that's really uh, <laughs> part of what we want to educate people on here. Everybody's got to take their own acceptable you know risk as to you know how much gear, how little gear they want to wear, and we'll talk about that throughout this episode as to sometimes. You just don't want to wear all the gear. Um, but hopefully we can help to educate some riders as we jump into, you know, kicking things off around apparel. Uh, and then we'll get into some discussions around helmets as that pertains to, to motorcycling as well. But I think kicking things off with apparel probably sounds like the right place to start. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. And uh, what, 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 how do you want to handle this? Do you want Pat to give a sort of a broad overview of, uh, of, <laughs> of, 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 of apparel safety ratings and uh, impact versus abrasion, that kind of thing? What, what well, do you think makes sense? I, I think we start off with, you know, over the past couple of years, and Pat, we're going to start with you um, as, as the expert that can educate Zach and I. Um, <laughs> we've seen a flurry of new motorcycle gear safety yeah. ratings. So maybe just if we could start off for the listener, if someone's going out to buy some gear and they're looking at CE or CE AA or CE AAA, like just give us a, a quick education on what all of that means. A quick, a quick education. Yeah. <laughs> so I, the past, the past couple of years, we've seen an extreme advancement in safety, specifically out of the European Union, um, because that's what I, for everybody at home that doesn't know, that's what CE is. It's it's Europe's rating for. Hey, is this protective gear? Yes, no. Uh, and they break that down into certain rating systems. So it's kind of a suggestion for the U.S., but a lot of these brands tend to build the gear for both markets. So it's in their interest to build one that you know does both. So if anybody's hearing that at home, like the CE for abrasion, um, they they categorize things for what speed they can last in a slide. They categorize armor, uh, helmets for impact. Now rotational impact is starting to come play. So there's there is a lot of updates and everything that goes through there, but. It's hard to break it down to a very simple concept. Uh, all you need to know is in, I think it was 2019, the new ratings came out for abrasion, for apparel specifically. And what it did was it took a very rudimentary, you know, testing thousands and thousands of rotations of textiles, leathers, things like that, to see if it can withstand it, to actually imitating a slide. It's the best way to describe it is that the machine that they use now actually imitates weight hitting the ground at a certain speed down to zero. So you're imitating someone coming off the bike, hitting the deck, and sliding, say, at 100, uh, 100 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, and they grade it by did it survive in that crash. So it's a much more realistic um, testing standard now as of 2019. And I believe every brand had until, I want to say it's 2022 or 2023, uh, March uh, of that of this coming year, I believe it is, to meet that standard, so they could get through of all their old inventory, and then everything from that point on had to then be tested to that standard to be sold in Europe. So that's why we're seeing all these triple A's, double A's, and A's starting to come out of the the woodwork. So help and, us help us understand for a second: is it a law in Europe? Like, do you have to wear protective motorcycle gear if you're riding a motorcycle? If you're claiming your gear is protective as a retailer, uh, as a brand, you have to certify it and say like, hey, we passed XYZ test. Um, and in that testing system, it's a uh, the A scale. So it's AAA is the top tier, AA, A. And then they also have a B and a C, which have their own little kind of nuances. Um, and originally the idea was AAA was think a race suit. Uh, we've now seen textiles surpass that. We just shot a Badlands Pro recently that 
um, that pass that that standard. Double A is like your average commuter might hit highways, could, should probably be projected up to that mile per hour. Uh, and then A, I usually categorize as around town, smaller speeds, you know, Zach the Grom you just shot on would be a perfect example. You really only need A gear for that if you're running around town. Uh, and then B and C are armor rigs and airbags, basically. Things that either have abrasion but no armor, or things that have just impact protection, no abrasion. Uh, so those are the standards that they just put in for specifically for abrasion testing. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah. And is there a um, is there a big leap in your mind? Like, is is it all pretty linear, or would you say like the leap from from you know uh, the A rating to the double A rating is a really large step up, or or anywhere along the line there? They're they're pretty linear. Yeah. Um, okay. When when you test it, and it's just you know they increase the mile per hour, but the nice part is. If you're saying something is AAA, not only do the high abrasion zones, like at the elbow, the shoulder, things like that have to be tested uh, where you're probably going to hit, they actually increase the protective abrasion in like the chest, at the side. Things you're probably not going to hit, but if you do, you should be protected because this is the best certification. But the nice part is they also require armor as you go up. So uh, A and AA, you, you have to have shoulder and elbow armor. When you get to AAA, you have to include the full everything. Everything has to be included in it. Um, so they're really grading it, and that went from yeah, this jacket is protective to, hey, this jacket is protective and here's the standards it meets in a slide. So it's a really good advancement. And I, I think we've seen the US market pick up on it because it's an easy grading system. It's an easy way to do it. Uh, so as long as the brands are willing to pay the extra cost to get it tested, it's a nice little benchmark to say, hey, I know what I'm wearing is protective. And, so and are just, there, I'm sorry, just to back yeah, up for ahead. one second to one thing that he just said. So just to be clear, Pat, up until like when you're talking about like, oh, the jump to, to CE, AAA has to have everything. I just want our audience to realize, and maybe this is, you know, there's someone listening that's not familiar with this. Typically what we've seen is motorcycle jackets will oftentimes come with elbow and shoulder armor with a pocket for a back protector, and you have to add the back protector separately. Is that correct? So when you're saying the jump to AAA, that would now, to get to AAA, you have to sell the back protector as part of the jacket. Is that correct? Yeah, to, to meet okay. the strict guidelines of what the, the AAA means, you have to include right. it. Whereas um, pants are a great example. With an A-level uh, pant, you only have to include the knee, but you have to have a pocket for the hip. Once you get to AA and AAA, you have to include both. There's no, You cannot pass those without armor. Even though it's an abrasion test, you don't even get in the door without having the right requirements meeting, met in the uh, armor pockets. So, and uh, how... I think that's a good segue to talk about armor <laughs> mm-hmm. because the rating systems are there's, there's a similar, like the, the, um, the certifications for Europe, the CE ratings are, uh, in place for armor as well. And is it the same, is it the same tiered system and is it the same approximate, uh, testing that they do or how, how does, how does that work with armor versus, versus abrasion, like scuffing? Yeah. So, and, um, the, the nice part that we've seen here, and it is a perfect segue in armor because, the AAA, AA, A is very reminiscent of CE level one and CE level two for impact armor. That's how they're graded in a one and two scenario, two being the better, more protective armor, one being just armor that has been tested to protect to a certain degree. Um, but it was an easy concept for the US market and all markets in the world to digest, even though it's just for Europe. Right. It's an easy thing to, to you know really adapt to and the factories that make all the gear for all the world because all the brands, even just U.S. brands, use the same factories. It's all every, usually the same places are creating all the same gear. Um, so they already have this armor here, so it's a nice standard. So what we're seeing is AAA, AA are being adopted too. But when it comes to armor, impact armor, there's only two. It's level two and level one, um, and it's how much energy passes from, say, if you hit the deck, how much energy goes through the uh, armor and hits you as the rider. And right. they get very strict with that. Um, for back armor, it's 18 kilonewtons for CE level one, whereas with a level two, you can't let more than nine kilonewtons pass through to the rider. So it actually cuts it in half. With elbow and shoulder, I think it's 35 and 20. Um, but you just know you're increasing exponentially the amount of armor or the amount of uh, impact energy that is not passing through once you go right. up. Right, right, right. So, and and, and a, a kilonewton of force is roughly like if I took a baseball bat and just pounded you in the elbow, <laughs> yeah. how, how many kilonewtons would that be? Well, if you hit a tree at 15 miles an hour, you know, and wrap it fully around, no, it's uh, it, it is it is a decent amount of pressure. It's enough uh, ma- enough energy to move a kilonewton or a kilo of mass. Uh, I think a certain distance. So it, it is a very scientific process, but it's easily uh, repeatable. So they can easily you know constantly hit armor and make sure it tests. But you cannot have a stamp on your armor that says CE at all unless you've passed one or two, which is a nice benchmark. And that's so, the other that's the other thing too is as we look at like the armor that 
is the, the newer armor, it, you, it's repeatable, right? So it mm. used to be, you know, I remember back to some of the earlier armor, some of the hard armor, where if it took a hit, uh, oftentimes it would have to be replaced or it, it would have to be checked out. But a lot of the armor that we're seeing now, you can, it, it's good for multiple impacts, correct? Yeah, yeah. Most armor at this point is um, D three O is a great example. It's molecular based, so it can it becomes rigid on impact. Whereas um, very, it was very reminiscent of like styrofoam. It's a dense foam, but once it crushed, it crushed. You you crushed all the cells inside of that foam. So most brands at this point, I think almost all have gone away from that, just because the other armor, the better armor, is so cheap to use. If they're using a third party, if they're designing their own, it's pretty cheap to use. So we don't really see the open cell foam style armor, single use armor, much anymore. Right. So uh, all this discussion so far has been around CE, which is the, the European rating system. And it sounds like you're, what you're saying is based on where apparel is uh, manufactured and where it's sold, people are just sort of adopting these and because they want to be rated for sale in Europe because the market in Europe is good, whether they're selling in America or making them in Pakistan, whatever. But are there other standards? Are there any other standards for for abrasion resistance and and armor that that are worth noting that that are used ever or is that kind of just become the global standard and it's the thing that people should pay closest attention to it's the one if you were going to invest most of your time that would be the one to go research the other ones right. um, that are out there are smaller it's really just a company you know company by company or even the brand that sells the fabric itself they did right. a special test and it's like I, I think uh, a lot of the uh, the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene materials out there, they're always like, we're 15 times stronger than steel. It's like, yeah, but what does that mean if I come off my bike and slide? So there's like, they right, have right. these different um, marketing <laughs> phrases and things like that. But CE has been widely adopted as the easiest and Europe is the biggest market. So it's where like we get the trickle down uh, from everybody out there. It's so like Dionese, right. Alpine Star has kind of set the standard and everybody follows soon thereafter. Right. Well, right. It's, it's funny so, that you, it's, I was just say it's funny that you mentioned ultra high molecular weight polyethylene because when we were pre proing for this episode, you know, I was like, man, we could probably do an episode on just like understanding riding genes because like the, every, all of these materials that people mm. use to figure out how they're going to make things abrasion resistant are so different. And there's so many different materials out there, especially in the synthetic world when you get away from leather. Um, where people are coming up with all different types of ways to get those ratings met. And, and each one is a little bit different. Like some, you know, materials, if you touch them to an exhaust pipe will melt, others won't. Some transfer heat differently, <laughs> some, you know, so it is right. interesting to see how much technology has been put into this over the past, you know, 15 years or so. Yeah. 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 It's totally fair. Um, so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about helmets later, and we're going to talk about practical usage of gear. So I don't want to get too distracted, but I'm curious: are there are there ratings for gloves and boots as well? Because we talked about apparel, and we sort of mentioned helmets. But we're going to talk about that later. Uh, what about gloves and boots? Are there are there are those do those CE standards uh, apply to to gloves and boots? And are there ratings, or is it more just sort of like a touch and feel thing? So there are ratings for them. Um, they didn't get included in the overhaul that happened in like 2019 when we saw the AAA, AA start to go into practice. Okay. They didn't get that overhaul, and I'd imagine one's probably coming. Um, the European Union likes to make these regulations, and I think it's good for all riders out there, but it does take time for all them to come together and figure out what's right. the best thing. But gloves are tested for like seam strength, uh, retention, whether it stays on your hand in an accident, uh, tear strength. Um, knuckles are a certain rating system. They're on a level, uh, gloves in, right now are the CE level one, uh, CE level one KP, meaning it passes CE level one, but has knuckle protection. And then CE level two, which is like, um, the Alpine Star Super Tech uh, was one of the ones, the only ones I knew for a long time that passed that standard. Um, no one else really went for it. It wasn't, no one wanted to, needed to build up such a beefy glove for that. But right. they do have their own standards and boots do as well. Um, boots test things like crush proof. You know, if the bike lands on your foot, the sole has to be able to be rigid enough not to be crushed. Tear strength of the materials, seam strength, all those things. Um, ironically enough, there's no ankle protection regulation when it comes to boots. And I think we all know as riders, it's like the, one of the most susceptible things to right, right, yeah. Yeah, on your feet. But there's there's just a guidance that if you're going to put a puck in there to protect the ankle, it should be about this size. But there's no regulation to it. So huh. I, I wouldn't yeah, be surprised if we saw those get updated uh, in the next couple of years. But uh, it's all TBD, really. Well, yeah. I think that's a great segue into what do you look for? Because 
it's one thing to say, oh, well, this is CE rated or, oh, this is CE AA rated, but like you just mentioned boots, right? And the first thing I look for when I'm picking a pair of motorcycle boots for the street or for off-road is torsional bracing. Like I want to know, I want to know that it's not going to be able to just, and torsional bracing for those of you listening that aren't familiar, um, it's, it's bracing that goes from the bottom of the foot up over, over the ankle and it doesn't allow the boot to move from side to side. So if you are in an accident, the boot has bracing in there so that it's less likely that you would break your ankle. Um, and it's one of the first things that I look for in a motorcycle boot. And, you know, I guess because it's it's not that I'm looking for a certain rating, I just know that that's a feature that I want to have. So I guess, Pat, you know, as we as we talk about, you know, as we segue into like um, some of our recommendations or the things that we gravitate towards, like, is it a CE rating that you look for when you're choosing motorcycle gear or is it product specific like what is where do you normally start your search like if you're recommending somebody that has never bought motorcycle gear for the first time like how would you recommend that they start their search so i and i hmm, that's a great question that is a very loaded and great question um Pat McHugh because, probably starts his search by how does it look do yeah. i look awesome in these boots cool i don't yeah. care about the safety at all yeah. how many years <laughs> does it take off while i'm riding down the road on <laughs> exactly. this one? Now, um i do i take ce regulations into the factor process when i'm looking at gear but i also realize that any u.s brand that doesn't sell in europe has zero obligation to the go pay money to european the european union to test things they don't have any obligation they're not going to waste money on it so i take it as a guideline but also it's just common sense and in, in my opinion you know if you look at any pair of jeans and they have like a single seam along the outside that's kind of a negative for me because i'd rather have double stitching or triple stitching something i know it's like hey that's if i go down i'm gonna hit that side i want it to be completely reinforced yeah. Um, when it comes to boots, it's the same thing. You know, I look for the hinge system as well, and it's common sense. If I'm riding a small bike, like a pit, my pit bike in the backyard or something like that, and just putt-putting around, I'll throw on some beefier boots, but I don't go for the hinge system because I want all that movement I need to be able to shift around. But once I get off-road or go to any rock garden, I have to have pretty much an immobile foot um, and knee brace system. So you look at riders like Graham Jarvis, some of the best enduro riders in the world, they're all trials background, and they don't use hinge systems on their ankles just because they want movement. They know that they're going to be hmm. worse off from a safety factor if they can't move their foot than when they can save themselves or do this with a brake or shift into another gear. So personally, I, I take my application into the equation, and if I'm riding on the street or if I'm riding off-road, I kind of look at it as like, I don't need the beefiest because I trust my own skill, but also I want to be as protected as I possibly can and possibly afford. Yeah, yeah. I like I like that. And I'd like to tack on a question to, to what Spurge said. Um, what are some things, or if if at all, are there any things that you would say are, um, kind of? Because I think what we're what we're reaching for here a little bit is when you purchase a product, whether you look at the CE rating or not, is to kind of like have the have what you're gonna do on the motorcycle in mind and think like, well, where do I want protection? Where do I not care? And that's that's totally fair. But are there things that might fool people into thinking that there's protection when there isn't? Um, I know, I mean, I think knuckle protectors on gloves are a good example that come to mind for me. Like some of them are really flashy and burly and they're made of carbon fiber and that's cool, but, but you should probably be looking at other things in the glove also. Right. So are there any other things that come to mind with you or apparel or boots or gloves where, where you think like, Oh man, people always go for the X, Y, Z, but really that doesn't actually help you that much in, in a rating system or in a crash. So yeah, there's two that actually come to mind that I get asked about a lot. Um, if you ever notice on some gloves, they connect the pinky and the and the ring finger, the third and fourth finger bridge. Alpine Stars did it for years, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. once sure, the yeah. patent expired, everybody could use it. Um, we always had an old saying here: it's like, well, if you have it on there, that's great. All it does is really help you snap two fingers instead of one, just because it's going to pull <laughs> that one out the side. So a lot of people see it and they're like, oh, that means beefy, that means protective. And it's like, well, to a certain application, yeah. But if you're going to crash, it's you know, tell me how you're going to crash, and I'll tell you exactly what to wear. Right. Uh, Which of course is a hard ones. question to answer when you go up for a ride. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and and a lot of people don't notice when they if you buy a new jacket, most brands for a while they put a piece of foam in the back to help you put it on and size it and be like, oh, this is what it would fit like if I put a back protector in it. Gotcha. But a lot of people think of that and they feel it and they're like, oh, there's a back protector in there when it right. is not a back protector. I mean, it's as soft as paper in there. So they put it in there as a placeholder and we're seeing a lot of brands get away from that idea and that concept. Uh, but I think it fooled a lot of people into thinking, oh, I'm protected uh. when it's like, you know, your spine is one of the most important things to protect. Um, one of the most susceptible things to get, to get hit in an accident. So that was one that I, I heard a lot of people, it's like, oh, it already comes with a back protector. No, it, it doesn't. Nice. Yeah, that's good. Those are good notes for sure. So it's yeah. interesting. I have an example of something that kind of ties into what we're talking about here. And I was debating whether or not to 
to tell this story up under my, you know, the time that Moto Gear saved my my butt. Um, <laughs> but you know, we talk a lot about CE ratings, and and I think what I see a lot, especially in the adventure world, is people just using you know adventure pants with the armor already in the pants. And I've really kind of shifted over to wearing a standalone knee protector, whether it's a, a hinge, you know, just knee guard like Liat or Alpine Stars makes, or it's a full on knee brace. Um, but the example that I'll give you is, you know, I, I think that oftentimes when we look at knee armor as it is in standalone pants, that does a great job of, you know, to your point, Pat, like, tell me how you'll crash and I'll show you what you need. Whereas if you're going down and you're hitting the front part of your knee, it helps protect your kneecap. But oftentimes if you're going down in a low slide or a slide, you know, you're rubbing kind of sideways. And I was at a launch for the uh, uh, Triumph Scrambler 1200 and it was pouring down rain in Portugal. And they actually, all of our ride leaders pulled us aside ahead of time and they said, listen, you know, um, the, the roads here get really <laughs> slick. As soon as there's a little bit of rain, like it's like ice. And so we're just gonna have everybody be really careful. And I, it was the street day. It wasn't the off-road day, but I had only one set of gear with me. So I was wearing my, my knee braces underneath, you know, a pair of dirt pants as my on-road outfit. And we were going around a corner at like 15 miles an hour. And it was like out of nothing, the whole bike just washed out and slid. And the, and and the sun was in his eyes and he was, it was like kind of uphill. It was no, like super it, tricky. It was like a little dirty. It was, like, yeah, it totally, was not, man. it was, there was nothing. There was, it was like, it was an easy right hand corner. We were going slow. Um, and even the, the, I was in the back of the pack and the, one of the triumph right leaders was behind me. He's like, dude, he's, he's like, you just, it just washed out. But my point to that was, I slid across the the, the, the pavement and, and my leg was trapped under the bike, but because I had my knee brace on, the knee brace almost acted like a slider and I and that it it's it did not damage the bike and it did not damage my, my <laughs> leg. I walked away and then I just had this like almost like a, a grind through the aluminum uh, of the knee brace. But it's one of those ones where you know you could be wearing CE level three pants. But that's not going to protect you in that type of a crash, or at least it's not going to protect you to the level of having a knee brace on the, that, that the knee brace was able to act as a different type of protection. So for me, yeah. I've really gravitated towards standalone knee armor or standalone knee braces as part of my regular uh, off-road riding kit. But also, you know, if I'm doing on-road, off-road stuff, like knee braces are like a, a must-have for me at this point. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Well, um, we are going to dive into talking about helmets and uh, and also some hypotheticals uh, where we can give actual recommendations and practical suggestions for gear. However, Spurgeon Dunbar, we do have a piece of business to take care of before that, don't we? I think we have a motel ad to get to. Uh, that's right, everybody. Okay, so we are back, and I think we're going to pivot um, to a, a quick little chat around helmets because yeah. those do have a different safety rating uh, than, than what we're familiar with with apparel, and, and the safety ratings around helmets have been around for a little bit longer. Um, with the exception of, you know, recently, Pat, we saw an FIM standard come into play, uh, which is separate of what we typically hear uh, debated, which is like the Snell versus ECE debate, and... Does DOT even matter? There's so much to unpack here, Pat. So, like, what should someone looking at helmets care about? Snell, yeah, ECE, talk DOT? What are they? What are they looking for? <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, that's, it's a very loaded, just like CE abrasion. It's a very loaded topic. <laughs> um, but what what I would say is, if you're in the U.S., you have to get DOT if you're riding on the road. Uh, you start there. That's as basic. And I think everything everything that you can find for the most part in the U.S. is uh, as long as it looks like a real helmet is usually DOT certified. But I always say get something extra too. You know, ECE 2206, which is the European Union's newest uh, regulation, whether it's FIM, Snell, anything a little bit more than DOT is what you're going to be looking for. Um, just because, yeah, DOT is a bit archaic in their design. I think it's, I mean, it's been around for decades at this point. I mean, the light, the I've, standard. I've seen DOT stickers on helmets that you just wouldn't really want on your head if you were in a crash. Yeah. So yeah. what what do you know about the DOT uh, testing and standard. I mean, like you said, it's been around a long time, but like it must be pretty minimal. I, I'm like I said, I've seen some like just absolute punch bowls of helmets that are really minimalist, and they have a DOT sticker, so it doesn't take much. I take it. 
No, it doesn't take much. I mean, what, what a DOT sticker or a sticker on the back of your helmet will get you is not a ticket if you get pulled over. That, that's basically <laughs> where I draw I draw it at uh, that you have to have it legally. But I, I mean, you. it's an old it's an old testing that tests a single impact at a speed that'll probably crush your brain regardless. Mm. Uh, but it makes sure that you can survive that. But the the big catch there is you don't pass the test and get the sticker. You read the regulations, oh yeah, our helmet meets that, and you put the sticker on your helmet, and at any point, the Department of Transportation can test the helmet I and get see. a full size run, and be like, hey, you know what, you weren't in accordance with it, but they don't have to test it beforehand, where everyone after that, you have to send it to get tested before you get the sticker put on the helmet. And I think that's the biggest ah. the biggest hiccup for a lot of people, yeah. is like, oh, it's DOT, it's great. It's like, well, you know, until they get caught, and it's not, or just outright, it's like, it, it is a very old and archaic yeah. um, so that's, testing system. That's a huge loophole, basically it's an honor system, you yes. have to read the regulations and follow them, but you don't have to have it tested. Whereas a European Union for ECE 2206 or any European standard, or especially FIM or Snell, those products like the abrasion and, and impact protection you're talking about in apparel have to be tested and certified by that sanctioning body. Yeah, by that sanctioning body. And since the impact of DOT helmets is so high, technically for the US, you actually have to make the shell a lot stronger and a lot more rigid for a single impact when what the studies that we're seeing and the studies that ECE 2026 just updated to FIM updated to and what we're probably going to see snow 2025 factor in is rotational and slow speeds are where most of the damage is coming from uh, is you know any not like a tip over I'm talking like if you're going like 25 miles an hour and you hit the ground you're going to hit a couple of different areas around the shell and it's going to be it's going to dissipate the energy is going to dissipate because you are slowly uh, slowing down excuse me um, so that, that's what we've seen with the updates. Uh, and really it's just something like DOT is a great starting point. You're going to need that if you're riding on the roads in the U S and then add on something from there. Like whether it's FIM, EC 2206 or Snell, uh, I think you'll be better than you were before. Does FIM even matter? Like I get Snell, I get EC, like it, does anybody give a about FIM? <laughs> if you race for, um, what is it, MotoGP, World Superbike, and a few other classes, you are legally required to race. You have to have it, not legally, because it's not a law, but it's it, to be able to race on that, you have to have it. But what we saw was it was the first, it was the first racing standard that started from motorcycling, because Snell was a, it's, an, it's a car, um, auto racing standard that right, they brought right. over to motorcycles. Right, and right. a lot of that doesn't translate well because if you're in a car and you roll, you're probably hitting the left side, then the right side, then the left side, then the right side. And they use that same algorithm. So it's kind of based in the wrong area. Right. FIM just did their own testing and their own standards to really design something that is based in moto racing, but it's not required anywhere other than those those areas. But what so, it did was it started the rotational impact conversation. So I, I, wanna, I wanna pivot back to the Snell thing but yeah. first um uh what is the fim so so spurgeon asked does it matter which is fair because it's like the standard is so high right if you're racing mm -hmm. MotoGP, you have to have an fim helmet and that's great but what is it does it include rotational is that what it does and yeah okay yeah, so, well i don't want to i don't want to talk about that yet then sorry <laughs> let me no, let no. me interrupt you because i don't want to jump into that quite yet i want to talk about the snell thing just to touch on that um because it is a car standard um as you said initially a lot of what that regulation includes correct me if i'm wrong is multiple impacts in the same point as though you were in a car and it rolls and you're hitting your head on the same place in the helmet and the same place in the roll cage again and again or more than once at least yeah and applying that to motorcycling historically people have sort of i think it's i think it's sort of largely agreed upon in the motorcycle industry that, that doesn't necessarily make sense because you're so much less likely to hit your head in exactly the same place during a motorcycle crash so it it creates a standard for the shell the helmet that isn't necessarily um, as applicable or realistic in a motorcycle crash. Is that right? Yeah, and it, it did a great job for years, and I know a lot of track organizations required Snell certified helmets yeah, for yeah. a little while there, and it was a great standard to be like, okay, well, the shell is very protective, but when they're, when they're doing the double impact, it's on the same location, so they even, um, every organization out there came to the conclusion that that doesn't happen. That's not realistic. You know, it might happen, but your odds of that happening are not very high to the point where yeah. even Snell created a second standard of their 2022, or I'm sorry, their 2020 standard. They split it to have a single impact test so that other companies could pass it uh, without having to pass. Because if you pass, say, ECE 2206 or FIM, you can't really pass Snell, 
because you can either do one or the other just because uh-huh. your shell would be so fragile from a lighter single impact on one location, then they test it on another one. But if you do double in the same. Gotcha. Yeah, so it, there was another standard. Um, actually, uh, the friend of, I know your show, because he was on here, um, Ryan Fortnine did a great video explaining like Snell split into two standards. Kind of, it didn't make much sense uh, out there. So, But FIM coming out and ECE are fantastic standards to look at if you need a second one on your helmet. Yeah, to, to, give, to give the audience kind of clarity into what we're talking about, because... If you're listening to this and you're new to motorcycling, this might all sound very confusing. Yeah, Essentially, <laughs> what Snell was doing was in order to get a Snell safety rating, you had to make the helmet so, let's just use the word, so hard mm-hmm. that it could <laughs> it could handle multiple impacts in the same location. The problem is, you know, you would, you know, and oftentimes there were, there were stories of people would still get a concussion because the helmet wasn't absorbing enough of the impact. So when you saw ratings like ECE come out or now FIM, they were the helmets were a bit softer to take more to absorb more of the impact, but they just didn't they couldn't absorb that same amount at the same place in the helmet twice, right? So in theory, Pat, like the ECE allows the helmet to be a little bit softer, which in some cases might be a, a better use case for motorcyclists is essentially what we're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that, and that's a great way of looking at it. And in, in Snell's defense too, I think they come out with a new standard every five years. It's uh, we're on the current is 2020. We'll see a 2025 coming uh, soon. By the time all these new regulations came out, FIM ECE 2020 was already set and was getting ready to roll out. Uh, so what we saw was when FIM launched in, I think it was 2018 or 2019, the 2020 standard for Snell was already set. We had an open letter from the president of Snell saying like, hey, that kind of screws over all of our standards by coming out with these motorcycle-specific standards. <laughs> what I think that does is then it takes a the foundation of Snell it kind of forces their hand to make a better product for 2025 to figure out, hey, let's look at the data. Let's really design right. something specific for motorcycles. So I'm anxious to see it. I wouldn't be surprised if 2023 was the year we start hearing that 2025 is getting settled right. um, and the new standards coming out. But I, I think it just all it does is push everybody to do better. And that's in every rider's interest at this point. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So before we before we move forward with the helmet conversation, because interesting stuff to talk about coming up, but what, uh, what, is there is there anything about the ECE um, testing, the European testing um, that you know that is um, that is like that is interesting or different than uh, than what people might expect? Like how 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 is that rating built and how is it tested? So the FIM and ECE twenty two hundred six, I'll kind of combine those into into one category. Uh-huh. What they factored in the latest, so twenty two hundred six is the latest ECE rating that yep, everybody's yep. everybody's going to be forced by again twenty twenty three to meet that standard. What it factored in was rotational impacts. So they weren't just doing you know a big weight comes down and smashes a helmet in one spot. What they're actually doing is they're angling the helmet and having it hit it, but also bounce off. So they're doing all the impact, straight impact testing, but now they're doing, um, I believe the term's oblique like, testing, where it's actually bouncing right. off or, right, or right. off to the side to mimic if you're hitting a curb. Uh, what's going on? Because your head doesn't just hit it in a straight line and then you bounce off in a straight line. You hit it and deflect off in most right, right. scenarios. So yeah, that so rotational to, impact. So to so to, to to take a page out of Spurge's book and, and back up just for a second to make this a little bit more clear, it's, it's a little bit tricky to describe on a podcast if you're only listening, but you can imagine what Pat's talking about. A helmet hits the ground and the shell twists. It 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 rotates um, uh, in the direction of the impact, which isn't always dead on, especially if your head hits pavement as it's rushing by. The inside of the helmet, what these helmets that have rotational impact protection are designed to do is have the liner of the helmet, essentially where your head is, be able to rotate separate from the outer shell. So when the outer shell rotates violently as it hits the ground, the the internal part of the helmet and ultimately the liner and ultimately your head and your brain rotate more slowly. That that particular twist and rotation of the helmet is absorbed by what's inside. And that's not historically something that helmets have had, but uh, but that's that's something that they've started to focus on and uh, certain companies more than others in what well, you guys would know better than I would. How, when did that start happening? The last, maybe five years ago, eight I years mean, ago? I think you saw, so this is completely separate of safety ratings, right? Like if you're looking for rotational impact, you're, you're probably familiar with MIPS, which is multi-directional impact protection system. And MIPS is a separate company where helmet manufacturers would buy a MIPS liner and have that installed in the helmet 
typically you would know it was MIPS because it was a bright yellow inside liner. Now, recently, Pat and I were actually just looking at a helmet uh, that has a new MIPS liner that is it's black, so they've gotten away from that yellow. You have uh, uh, th- this one of the protection systems is called Rion, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I believe, Fly Design Rion. Or yeah, Fly, Fly Racing has that Fly one. Fly yeah. Racing has Rion. Um, 6D technology has... Yep. Uh, the little rubberized bumpers that sit in between two yeah. layers of EPS. ODS, yeah. Oh, the ODS system. Mm-hmm. Um, Pat, what's the other? There was one that wasn't there. Another there's, one I'm missing. There's the Bell Star Flex, right? Is that the same basic well, idea they, as the, they as just, the 6D thing? Well, they yeah. they they switched back. They have so there's with Bell Flex. The original technology was similar, kind of to what 6D was, but now the newest Bell Moto 10 is back to using MIPS along with. Uh, yeah. their 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 gotcha, proprietary gotcha, gotcha. technology. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. The the brand that everybody that really controls the industry right now is MIPS. Um, that's who it's very easy to use. It's very uh, people already know the name. It's very trusted. Other ones pop up from time to time, but I think everybody is starting to use MIPS more and more. And and right. Zach, you painted a great picture. It's what they realized was the impact isn't really all you need to worry about. What you need to worry about is protecting the brain inside of the skull because right. that's where you can really do some serious damage. So what you're doing is you're trying to give a little bit of movement, a little bit of slip. You know, maybe I think it's usually around six millimeters to. 10 10 millimeters of movement in the liner gotcha. to let the head naturally absorb yep. some of the impact. And they realized it because bicycling, um, not because of bicycling, uh, it was it was really noticed in bicycling and off-road riding because it's lower speeds. It's actually where it's more prone, where the right. head does a jerking motion. So they're noticing with those lower speeds, they needed to absorb some of that impact. But yeah, we've seen, uh, yeah, Fly had uh, Rion. There was a Fox one for a little while, and now they use MIPS. A lot of people are switching over to MIPS, and I think you're going to see almost... You're going to see almost every standard now have that factored in moving forward. If DOT changes theirs, that's the only outlier, but everybody's going to have to factor in rotational right. impacts. Here. And is there, a, is there a rating for rotational impact protection yet? Is there any standard? Now, there's there's the standards built into FIM and ECE, you know, how much it moves, I how see, much I it see. absorbs in that. Um, it's built into that, but there's no like, this is rotational standard one, here's rotational standard two. It's just built gotcha. into the um, angled impact testing within yeah, yeah. those standards. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think. And, and Zach, if if there's anything that you want to throw in here before we kind of wrap up helmets and, and move on, uh, the question that I wanted to, to pose to the two of you was what you each look for in a helmet and if there's a standard that you gravitate towards. Because I think, you know, you can you can get onto the internet and type ECE <laughs> versus Snell and find a world of debate. And there are people that are, you know... You know, died in the wool on either side of this this debate that they they swear by the standard that they believe in. Um, so I guess my question for you, Zach and or Pat, <laughs> is you know what do you look for in a helmet? Like, is there a certain standard that stands out, or is there so- something else that you know is is important to you when choosing a motorcycle helmet? Guest honors, Pat, you take it, man. Ooh. Um, yes, I, I think I at least look for ECE um, when it comes to a helmet on top of DOT. I at least go for ECE. I was okay with 2205, uh, the older standard ECE had. I think it introduced enough things. Uh, my commuting helmet on the street is getting ready to be needed to be replaced, so I'll be looking for MIPS or the like uh, technology. I've already have it in my Moto 10 for off-road riding. I have their spherical system, which is partnered with MIPS. 100% would not ride without anything that has it off-road. For the road, I was okay with it just because I already had the helmet before the standards were put into place. But <laughs> I'll be I'll be looking for MIPS or 2206 come come the new helmet, probably in the new year. Right, that's fair. Zach, I I'm a I think the ECE rating. I mean, I've ever since I mean 10 15 years ago, I've been on board with the with the ECE rating just because I think I I. I'm one of the people that thinks that the Snell rating historically is a little bit misguided. Mm-hmm. I don't think it makes sense for for a motorcycle helmet to have to take two or more direct impacts to exactly the same place. And I totally understand why that exists in the in the car or in the automotive world, especially with sure. competition. But it doesn't make sense to me in in uh, for for motorcycles. Um, and so I. Uh, there are other things that I weigh when I, when I, uh, when I choose a helmet to take on a, on a street ride. Um, but when I go to the racetrack, I am a big believer in this rotational impact protection. And I have worn, I think just about exclusively helmets that have either MIPS or, um, or, uh, uh, some sort of directional rotational directional impact protection, uh, on the track, because I think, I think that's, I think it's the safest version of a helmet. 
and and I've been I've seen the studies, I've seen white papers, I've seen the data, um, and I I'm a big believer in in uh, having a more complex and uh, yeah um, sophisticated system mm-hmm. in in a helmet, especially if you're in a situation like you're on you're going to a track day or a race or you're um, or you're you're riding in an environment where you feel like you're more likely to to whack your noggin. I think it's I think it's really it's great technology and it, and it should be adopted just as quickly as possible in my opinion. Yeah. And I think, I think one thing to always keep in mind is like, I, I think Spurge, how many helmets have we seen that have like emergency release cheek pads? Uh, it's like one of those key marketing terms and everything like that. I don't look for it in helmets because no. no EMT that shows up on site. If I get into an accident is going to be like, well, you know what? I know exactly <laughs> how to get this helmet off of his head without moving his neck. I'm just going to pull these cheek pads out. They're not going to touch you. They're going to figure out a way to get you to the hospital. If you're, if you have, they have to stabilize you, if you're at a racetrack, maybe in SoCal where they know right. the, the eject systems or emergency release, um, cheek pads work and that's how they can get them off. That's one thing if you're out in the middle of a street no emt that is working part-time or just start out is going to go you know what i know exactly how to get this helmet off him so yeah. there's certain factors that it's like i see a reason for them i don't necessarily need them when i'm shopping for a new helmet though yeah, that's fair what about you spurge i i don't so i agree with everything spurge doesn't wear a helmet he doesn't believe in helmet stop laws as we learned it. in the last stop one stop it. and he, do not start hair. do not start <laughs> this rumor because the, i've already gotten enough people sending me <laughs> messages on on instagram and such about when you've got a Humble skull Lose. as thick as spurgeon dunbar jesus Christ. you need no helmet <laughs> i mean you can't contain that hair that that is <laughs> that true. is something that the people need to see no to be clear i would like just to hang on quick sidebar here i watched someone fall off in the rain in portugal and the asphalt was incredibly slippery it was ridiculous spurgeon is not full of it and of course he wears helmets i i i just and i make fun of spurgeon but but all everything he has said thus far makes sense, and of course he wears a helmet when he rides. It's all just for the entertainment of our audience. That's <laughs> Zach truly does love me. Otherwise, um, no, I, I I like what everyone is saying about rotational impact, and I probably look at the overall features of a helmet before I I look at what it's rated for for safety, and, and really. The one thing that I don't think we talked about because we're focused really on the rating systems, but a helmet fit, I think, is sometimes something that gets overlooked yeah, because for sure. if a helmet doesn't fit you correctly, it can it can actually make you feel like the motorcycle is moving. It can make you feel like you don't like you don't have control. There, there's all the, these studies oh, that can, were done. It can cause headaches. It makes your ears yeah. hurt. There's like right. limitless things that it can lost screw up. Lost focus. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're looking at. It's just lost focus on the road. Right. And and uh, honestly, if the helmet doesn't fit you correctly all the safety standards in the world aren't going to to help you if the helmet slides off or moves or, or does other things. So I think finding a helmet that fits correctly is is number one. And I think it's an important note. We have a video on like how to size and buy a motorcycle helmet. And it talks about the fact that like we get messages all the time from people that are like, oh, well, uh, this helmet's too tight on me. So I went up to an extra large and it feels a little bit loose, but like uh, that's the size that I need. And I think it's important to note that like there's intermediate oval head shapes and long oval head shapes and round oval. And so like different helmet manufacturers cater to different shapes. And, and it's really important to find a helmet that, that matches with the, the, the actual shape of your head. Outside of that, uh, you know, I want something more than DOT. Right, I own ECE yeah. helmets. I own Snell rated helmets. Um, I've crashed in both. I've crashed in helmets with MIPS. <laughs> I've crashed in helmets without MIPS. Um, and I will say, you know, as I as I go further and faster in my motorcycle career, like the rotational thing has been the the biggest thing I look for. I I'm a little bit torn on like what I want for that. And and, and I'll say this because. Arai is one of my favorite brands, but Arai typically they say that they get their rotational protection from the actual design of this shell. They call it the R seventy five design, where they're actually saying the 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 shape of their shell is what creates the rotational the impact. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure if I believe it, but I like wearing Arai helmets, so some <laughs> some of it's just like they're what li- I like. Yeah, they're um, luxurious and comfortable. No no question yeah. about it. I think I think that's a I think the the fitment thing is a really good um, thing to bring up storage. And the thing that I'd like to say about that is that it's a it's it's not it's not, there are easier problems to solve than finding a helmet that fits. But if you can find a store that has a bunch of helmets, go try some on. Mm-hmm. It's it's not it's not rocket science. Just try some different helmets on and I th- and, and that's a great 
Wait, that's a great place to start. Like he Shameless said. plugged your local cycle gear store. <laughs> head exactly. down to your local cycle gear store and stick your head in a helmet. I will say, Zach, to your point about the track, um, I did I did switch my main track helmet to the Bell uh, Race Star a um, couple of years yeah. back because Attaboy. you know you look at what what Bell is doing and I, and I think it deserves a separate call out because there's not really a rating system that's just addressing this, but with some of the technology that Bell has has incorporated in. They're protecting for low speed, mid speed, mm-hmm. high speed, rotational. And it's really interesting to me to look at a company like Bell that is making such innovative advancements in helmet technology. And then you have helmet companies like Arai and Shoei that, frankly, aren't making any kind of new advancements. They're saying, no, our helmets have always been good. They're going to continue to be good. And you see some of these new manufacturers coming out like Bell and Fly and 6D. And the technology is just so sophisticated that you can't yeah. help but think, if I put this helmet on my head, I'm going to be safer. Yeah. yeah so, they're investing the R&D into it for you to get that. And I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Zach, but I mean, no, it's, no. A, it's a great point. I, I don't want to toot the bell horn and make it seem like they... Like they sponsored the podcast or anything like that. But what I want to point out is like if you watch like McAdoo's crash at Arlington a few years ago with that Bell Moto 10 on it, I watched him crash and he got up and then finished the race and podium the race. And it's like, yep, that, that's all I needed. I needed to watch that and I'll wear that helmet from now on. <laughs> I'm seeing these changes. I'm seeing the new technology come out. And it's like, is it proven? Great. Then that's all I really need to know is that it's yeah. something and people are pushing the needle. I would well, just say it, I, I'm not opposed to Bell sponsoring the podcast. There's no conflict sure, there with yeah, MoTool. No. We can have Bell and MoTool sponsor the podcast. Yeah, so. fair enough. <laughs> um, so uh, th- this is a. I don't want to spend too much time on this next topic, Spurge, because um, this uh, conversation is already already stretching out behind us. But we have on the list here uh, in our little uh, episode document: expensive helmet versus cheap helmet. And I think this is a good time to bring it up. Uh, Pat, because, you know, we're talking about a 6D with omnidirectional system, you know, ODS protection and, and Bellstar mm-hmm. Flex and MIPS and yada, yada. And it's convoluted because if you say, oh, I'm going to spend $750 on a helmet, I'm going to get it. That's a fairly expensive helmet. So that means it will be good. But that's not necessarily the case, right? So how, like, what advice would you give to people shopping for a helmet? Like, I, I, is there, is there a way to... To kind of break it down, I mean, you know, we talked about the ratings, but 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 you know, what what, is, what does that look like from your perspective? Absolutely, it, it's it's one of those topics I talked because I talk to a lot of new riders at events at, at things like that, any bike nights or things like that. When I when I show up, people have a lot of questions like, "Hey, I just started. Do I need to really go buy an Arai for eight hundred dollars?" Like, well, not really. You can go out and find a great hundred and fifty two hundred dollar helmet. And I think we've highlighted them in a few uh, videos that we've shot, like gear guides, beginner guides, like there's a $150 helmet from Scorpion that is Snell certified. It's 150 bucks. You lose some of the features of the comfort liner and, and certain things <laughs> right. and like multiple shell sizes that doesn't make it look like you're a bobblehead, but you have those impact protections. Um, even after what we just got through talking about Snell, there's plenty of ECE 2206 helmets that are going to be 150, $200, 250. That and, would I say compete with 400, $500 right. helmets that are just 400, 500 because the brand wants to sell it at that price. So I, I would put uh, a couple helmets up against some really expensive ones and still say I'd trust that one over that one. Right. I think yeah. I think it's amazing to me the difference in helmet quality mm-hmm. um, from when I started riding to what you see now. And you have brands like Bell, Fox, the new Sedici helmets. Um, that are incorporating MIPS technology into helmets that are $200 or yeah. less in some cases. So you're getting these helmets that are, from a safety perspective, are competing at a level that is a lot of the same technology that you're seeing in the $700 helmets. I think the biggest note um, is that when you are going up into some of those expensive helmets, you're cutting weight, you're cutting, you're adding comfort, and yep. you've got maybe in some cases better ventilation. They're yep. putting more research into sound testing, or you're getting things included like a pin lock ready face shield or a pin yep. lock inserts included in the box, things like that. You know, right, right. yeah, not necessarily yeah. safety regulation based stuff, but but luxury and features. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, so okay. I think I think no, I was just saying, I think the takeaway for anyone listening, especially for new riders, is mm-hmm. that like you can spend sub $250 and and again get a really safe nice helmet that's going to be so much better than the helmets that the three of us probably started out using um, yeah, when yeah, we, yeah. when we started our motorcycle career 
and and the one thing I always let people know is a lot of new riders will like I've talked to a few that inherit a helmet or well I had this helmet laying around so I used that one or I found this one it was pretty cheap but a buddy had it helmets only last five years if you start using them I mean it is EPS the the foam inside is expanded polystyrene like it, it's styrofoam it starts to degrade over time so a lot of uh, especially at our get on adventure fest a lot of the people I was like hey you should look at a new helmet I was saying that because like I haven't seen that helmet in 10 15 years <laughs> you, should, you should you might want to look at something Man. for yeah, 150 bucks that's all you need you can get something to replace it for that amount yeah there was a guy um uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I have seen, did you, did we, did we talk about that, uh, study of bicycle helmets on expanded polystyrene bicycle helmets that was done on like hundreds and hundreds of helmets over the course of many decades. And that showed that like the EPS didn't necessarily degrade in the way that helmet companies would have you believe, you know, like, I think it's easy for helmet companies to be like, you need a new helmet every five years or your yeah. race organization or whatever. Um, and it's maybe not as extreme as that, but it is a good piece of equipment to keep up to date because, Ari and I saw this guy at uh, one of our events that he was on a GS with climb gear. So what he's he's got a twenty thousand dollar bike with five thousand dollars worth of gear on, and he's wearing this helmet that seriously looked like it came with a Toys R Us bicycle or something. I mean, it was like <laughs> uh, it was just. I, I don't I don't know what the brand was. It was yeah. all it looked like it lived in the back of a pickup truck for a decade. It was like scraped up and dented and dinged and it was thin. It was like clearly didn't have a lot of foam in it. And Aaron and I were like, hey man, no offense, but like what what's with that helmet? Like it doesn't and he was like, Oh, I don't know. It just like just fits me. I just just comfy. I just like it. And yeah. at the end of the day, any helmet's better than no helmet, basically. Mm-hmm. But it was just shocking that he and it's not a resource thing, is the point. You know, like he has money. He, yeah, he has the funds. Yeah, exactly. He just, you know, it, he just sort of stuck in a rut like that. So anyway, so whatever. What, one, so before we, so uh, let's, let's kind of, we, we have some hypotheticals that we want to get to, but one more versus, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this one, Pat. So like we did expensive helmet versus cheap helmet. Another one that I see all the time, and this goes back to the start of the conversation around apparel, leather versus textile. What do you think, Pat? Like we hear people saying you have to have leather. You go to a track day, you have to have leather. Leather's yeah. le- leather's the best. Do you agree with that? Yes or no? That's the motorcycle gear bingo right there. That's the uh, that's the final <laughs> one of what the questions we get hit with all the time. Um, I think leather has its wins. Multiple multiple abrasions. You can take multiple accidents, and you see a lot of people's argument is like, well, once MotoGP or any pro racing switches to the textiles, then we can have that talk. In reality, there's a lot of textiles that have surpassed leather in so many abrasion categories. The problem is they get thicker, they get more expensive to use, brands don't want to use them. In my opinion, yes, leather is more is better for your average rider in accidents because you can use it multiple times. If you get into a slide, you can get off, you don't have to replace your jacket. It will uh, protect you, it'll do the, the sliding like all leathers will. I personally say that, and I go out and ride in textiles every single day. The reason being, exactly what Zach said with the, um, or I'm sorry, Spurgeon said with the, the helmets, I, every time I wear leather, I'm uncomfortable. I am a husky man in the mid-Atlantic region. <laughs> it is very humid here. Uh, leather and me do not get along, so I wear a mesh jacket almost all year round, and when it gets a little cold in the mornings, I put a raincoat over top of it. That's my comfort level. I don't want to be distracted while right, riding right. by being uncomfortable, but I know what I'm doing, and I know what I'm taking into uh, you know, consideration when I'm doing that. But I don't think the leather is king argument wins anymore. There's plenty of textiles that do okay. just as well on the abrasion scales. And honestly, there's issues with leathers. Look at Mark Marquez. Have you ever notice every time he gets into a crash, his leathers don't split open, but he always has his arm wrapped afterwards? It's because leather allows heat to transfer through, so he's actually burning his skin. Even though the leather's holding up, it's burning through the leather and hitting his skin, so mm. it's actually uh, doing more damage there lessons a lot of these leather companies are learning by putting Kevlar behind it. But I think the fact that a lot of leather uh, race suits on the top tier are adding textiles behind it that are abrasion resistant or maybe heat resistant is very telling of where the technology is coming over the years. That's a great note. Yeah. I think the, I think the other thing you hit on too is that like leather versus textile, which is better? Well, again, what are you trying to do? Because Mm -hmm. I think when you're looking at, you know, if you're riding across the country, and you want weather protection and you want a, a jacket or a pair of pants that does a lot of different things, like textile is easily the winner because you have waterproof baked in or you've got thermal that is added in or you've got all kinds of different features that, you know, from from pockets to, you know, I don't know, reflectivity or, or things that you can do with textile that you just necessarily can't necessarily pull off with leather. Um, I, I think there's something really classic 
about a leather motorcycle jacket and like I probably own more leather motorcycle jackets than I care to admit because it's kind of <laughs> like a weird collecting thing. But yeah, I think that my go-to for everyday riding at this point has easily become textile. I don't know about yeah. you, Zach. Uh, yeah, I wear a lot of textile for sure. I got my, my daily rider, um, rack behind, which, which Pat has helped me stock. <laughs> That's quite the assortment back there. I see it is, it is. Yeah. Products. You can't actually see it all either. Um, uh, but I guess if I'm looking at my daily rider jackets, I've got maybe five or six that I rotate through depending on the kind of bike, you know, like ADV jacket for an ADV bike, urban jacket, cruiser jacket, that kind of thing. I guess there's yeah. only one leather one, really. I've got a, I've got a, a, a nice high quality, uh, it's either Roland Sands or Alpine Stars um, leather jacket that I, that I rock on cruisers. And it's very sharp. Like if I was going to ride a motorcycle to a, you know, to a, to, a, to a dinner party or something like that, and I wanted people to think that I was dressed nice and snazzy, I'd wear that leather jacket. But, but yeah, I wear, I wear a lot of textile. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, it is hard to beat the, the versatility. And I haven't had a lot of bad experiences with textile coming apart in an accident either i Um, haven't i haven't either i think the other benefit for textiles we've seen especially as we get into the past few years of motorcycling the the advantage of textile is that it allows manufacturers to build stuff that's much more lifestyle oriented so you have things like riding shirts so people that that typically wouldn't wear motorcycle gear because they don't want to look like they're wearing motorcycle gear have gravitated towards some of these textile riding shirts or, or, you know, kind of lightweight jackets because it allows them to look like they're just wearing everyday clothing um, that actually has some protective qualities built into it. So that's a good point. And and the livability in textiles, um, to me, depending on your region, your locale, I mean, like you can get through a lot of different weather. Um, yep. riding scenarios, hot, cold, anything like that, a lot better than you can with a, with a uh, leather jacket. And, and I, I, you brought up a good point, and I, I wanted to clarify that too, Spurgeon, is that I'm not saying textiles are once and done all the time. You can usually get away with it and you know maybe get one through one or two, but generally speaking, it's like a leather can typically take multiple sides, where textiles, like, you, it did its job, replace it. Right. You know, you're that's not going to fix it. That's another reason that, that, like, I think that's another reason that track day apparel, mm-hmm. racing apparel is leather, right? Is that you can... Especially certain certain brands are like super beefy leather, so they're like they're meant to be club raced, and you're meant to be able to crash a half a dozen times in a season, and then <laughs> and yeah. then like maybe get it patched over the winter, but otherwise you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. I'm, I'm anxious for the day that uh, one company, and I think there's a couple companies I know that could do it that just have no interest because there's no market for it, but they make a textile leather or a textile alternative to a full race suit. Um, I know it's cap- they're capable of doing it. It's just whether. The first MotoGP rider wants to, or if Dorna would even allow them to. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. So you yeah. said uh, hypo, or you said uh, scenario, Pat, which gets mm. us into our final topic of the day, which is actually <laughs> hypotheticals, uh, which is a, a series of different scenarios that we've created, um, and we're looking for some specific examples here. So really, what we tried to do was our, our producer Chase created three different uh, people personalities in the motorcycling world and we're going to throw them out and and just give a a quick little what would we recommend for this individual if uh if someone listening can resonate with this so zach why don't why don't you give us the first one zach my wife and i do this whenever we see people riding without gear it's like well, I don't think she participates, but I tell her like that guy should be wearing this. And I think she's my wife listens when I talk to her. When I, <laughs> yeah. um, so the first hypothetical, the first um, person that we're going to outfit here is Daryl. Daryl's 51 years old, been riding for about 20 years, and Daryl is going to his first track day, um, and he's sort of like. Uh, he, he's not he's not uh, he's not on the Forbes list. He's not the richest guy ever, but he's got enough money to buy a bike to go to a track day and go enjoy himself and have fun. Um, what would we put him in? And I think to 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 give a a little bit of context here, um, we're looking for sort of um, you could do a two piece suit, you could do a one piece suit, um, you could do uh, you know you could do boots that are that are full zoot, or you could do sort of like sport touring boots. So Pat, what would, what would you put what would you put Daryl in? Uh, to go to his first track day. Sure. Just so I'm aware, am I supposed to be giving specific product examples? Because I, I think what most people might at home find surprising is I have our whole website memorized at this point in my <laughs> brain. So I have like every product we sell is somewhere up there. So I can outfit them or am I just giving like, oh, go with a you know a full leather suit? And then... Yeah, you can give examples of of particular okay. products if you like. But but mostly, yeah, we're looking for like categories of like, of uh, yeah, single piece, double piece or like uh, the uh, 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 strata of helmet mm-hmm. um, or strata of gloves or boots or something like that. 
Yeah, I think if, if you're getting into it and you plan on doing multiple track days, you bought a track bike, you're probably not just going once and then on the street. Go with a full piece suit, a full height with ankle protection, boot, something. A Sedici suit, an Alpine Stars missile would be a great option. Um, full height boot with ankle protection because the, the one thing I'd say, if you're getting into track days, just know you're probably going to be the one to crash You know, pretty soon after you start. You know, you're trying to push the limits. You're trying to find <laughs> the edge. It can happen, right? It can yeah, happen. Yeah. Yeah. And a full gauntlet glove would be great. I don't think – I wouldn't go as far as saying they'd need an airbag. That's something for, I think, someone really pushing the limits um, where the price tags are at with those. Um but I would say, yeah, any any Snell or ECE or FIM helmet would be great. There's plenty of those sub, I wouldn't say plenty, FIM helmets sub 500, but there are FIM uh, helmets that are under $500 you can easily get. Like uh, LS2 has uh, the Thunder Carbon. You have Scorpion isn't FIM regulated, but it is on the MotoGP track. So if they can trust it, you can probably trust it too. <laughs> uh, yep. And then, yeah, full full piece. I would go full piece and a back protector. I think that that alone right there will get you to the track and be able to get you in a couple of beginner classes. I like it. Spurge, uh, any notes there? Daryl's 51. He's been riding for 20 years. Uh, Daryl already has a good helmet. I trust that Daryl doesn't need to go buy a special helmet. <laughs> yeah, I that's would, fair. Fair I would suggest for Daryl, um, you know, a lot of these tractor organizations, you can rent a suit. He doesn't have to go out and buy it. Um, you know, so my recommendation is, you know, Daryl can rent a suit and see if he likes it. Now, uh, gloves may not want to rent gloves boots might not want to rent boots but like as far as like right. the overall suit goes i think you can rent a suit and i think that um you know you can get away with uh, a good pair of riding gloves that aren't necessarily full gauntlet 400 dollars race mm -hmm. gloves uh i think that even when i did my first track day i had a really nice pair of revit street riding gloves that i just used on the track and i was completely okay so i would recommend mm -hmm. Daryl, uh, you know, and this gets back to our how to do your first track day episode that we talked about with Jen. <laughs> like, um, Pat, I think I think you made a good point uh, with some of the affordable leather suits that are out there, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, the new Sedici suits are really nice. The new Alpine Star suits that are sub $1,000 are really nice. Um, I started with a two-piece suit. Uh, and I had, a, I had a jacket and I ended up going out and just buying a pair of pants to match it. And yeah. I think two pieces is a great option. But for Daryl, I'm going to recommend that he uses the helmet that he has. He probably has a nice pair of gloves that'll do. You're going to rent, uh, uh, you're going to rent a track suit for your first time, and <laughs> you might invest in a standalone back protector because he probably doesn't have one of those. And mm -hmm. he's going to invest, and he's going to invest in a uh, a nice pair of of track boots if he doesn't already mm -hmm. have those. Good, good recommendations all around. The one, I don't know if this is quite a disagreement with what you said, Spurge, but I think full gauntlet gloves is a must on the try. I, that, that, that would be my recommendation mm. for Daryl. Definitely yeah. full gauntlet gloves. They don't have to be $400 racing gloves. Like you said, they can be sort of, you know, sport touring gloves. If, as long as they have decent, um, uh, protection on the heel, the hand and, and, uh, the outer finger and that kind of thing. But I'm going to say full do you want, gauntlet Do you gloves. want full gauntlet? Cause you want the coverage over the wrist and then yes. up into the, into the exactly. forearm. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Good. Uh, I don't want. Good I don't set want of base layers too, just because that that suit's gonna yeah. be pretty sweaty if you're renting one of their yeah base, their base used, layers. Is a good suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> not 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 to do with protection, but good suggestion. Yeah. Um, what okay. do you think, Zach? Do you have a recommendation for Daryl that's separate of what we've talked about? No, no. Just just I would say full gauntlet gloves. I think what you, what you said makes sense. I think renting a suit's not a bad idea. I think ultimately he'll want to buy one, uh, and there are a lot of good options, like you guys said. I think we should move on to contestant number two, Jessica. Jessica's 29 years old. She is new to riding and she's moto or she she's commuting across the city. Um Jessica's on a scooter and you know she she doesn't want to look like a pirate. She just wants to, you know, go back and forth to work on her new scooter. Patrick, what do you recommend for Jessica 29 new to riding commuting across a major metropolitan area? So that's that's a good one. Um I would say one of everything, but I don't think you have to go to the, the full extreme. So when I say one of everything, you know, uh, jacket, helmet, gloves, pan, uh, riding jeans is per totally fine, and riding shoes. I don't think you have to go, like, with a double-A, triple-A rating if you're just going around the city at slower speeds on a scooter. But it, the likelihood of getting into an accident, in my opinion, in the city is a lot higher than it is outside of the city. <laughs> right, right. The accident changes because it's now lower speed involving another vehicle, from likely or a pedestrian, versus maybe in the, in the mountains you're just sliding out uh, at higher speeds. But I would say one of everything, and 
you can easily make things look like they blend in. Because if you're going around town, you're probably going to work. You're probably going to the store. You're probably going to a friend's house. You don't want to get off in a full, you know, two-piece race suit right. and, uh, and try to blend in. But sure. I would say something like that. And all, all those products, everything I just listed, you can easily get for under 200 some of them under $100. Uh, and, yeah, just be fully protected. Because my opinion and what I tell most new riders is you are the one who's most likely to get into an accident. Someone who's been riding like Daryl for 20 years, sure, he's he's got some experience behind there. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to keep it up right or <laughs> panic situations, something like that. A new rider, you're going to have a lot of panic situations, and you're going to want to prepare for every single one of those. So before Spurge and I give our opinions, just to be clear, you you think that um, that with with riding jeans and, a, and, a, and not necessarily a, a full zoot uh, jacket... Um, that Jessica will be protected enough for riding yeah. in a city. That that, that yeah. that's that that's the quote unquote enough protection uh, from from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I and I think taking that speed into factors is yeah. a great a great okay. way to look at it. Is like you don't need the craziest tech, but you should protect everywhere because yeah. you're at the high likelihood at that yeah, yeah. point. Okay, Spurge, any notes there on Pat's recommendation? I, I do, but I want to let you go first. So what do you got? Okay, gotcha. what, what do you think? Well, a couple things I would say. One, um, you can get lots of stylish kinds of gloves. What I like to see is wrist. Uh, closure. Sure, yeah. So uh, a Velcro or a snap that goes around the wrist so that the, the glove doesn't come off. At low speeds, it's less likely to come off. It's not a huge deal. Um, if it's the difference between Jessica riding and not riding, I would say go for it. What the heck? Get the glove that you that you really want. But I like to see wrist closure on gloves, even casual, uh, shorty, uh, non-gauntlet gloves. The other thing I would say is I almost don't even care what you're wearing on your feet as long as it just sort of covers your ankles and covers your toes and is made. I mean, it doesn't even have to be riding boots or shoes as far as i'm concerned they can be yeah, a set of tims will do you good doc martens yeah exactly mm-hmm. whatever um something something just something on your feet that's sturdy um and can't come off and covers the ankle that's that's what i want to see um and aside from that i think the recommendations are uh recommendations are good no, no other notes i don't think what about you spurge okay well pat started off strong zach backed it off a little bit i'm gonna probably recommend backing it off a little bit further to jessica only because I think that oftentimes it's easy for us to sit here and say, oh, well, you can get each of these pieces of gear for under $200. Jessica, who's 29, who just bought a scooter and wants to commute across the city, if she's buying a helmet for $200, a jacket for $200, pants for $200, gloves for under a hundred ish, <laughs> then it's like before you know it, Jessica is going to spend almost as much on a scooter as she did, or almost as much on this gear as she did for gloves. And I think <laughs> that's the hard thing here, right? Like, I do think it's something to work up to and, and have a great gear closet that you can choose from but for jessica to get started and commute back and forth to work i would like to see her in a helmet i think Mm -hmm. that a modular helmet oftentimes with scooters we see people go into three-quarter helmets i do like the full face chin bar i think that that extra level of protection is something especially for new riders however oftentimes a full face helmet might seem a bit restrictive so like a modular helmet for jessica something that she can open and you know talk to people and then close when she's actually riding i think is a okay. great recommendation yeah a, a lightweight you know textile jacket um you know probably you know i'm gonna guess jessica's maybe a fair weather rider to start off so something lightweight and comfortable maybe a mesh jacket um definitely i'm with you guys on gloves i think a good pair of gloves you know and you can get a great pair of gloves for sub 100 dollars but past that, like, yeah, wear your over-the-ankle boots that you probably already have, Jessica, and then wear a pair of long pants. I- I'm not yeah. even going to say that you need to go out and, and specialize in a pair of riding pants as the essentials. I think the essential for Jessica is a helmet, a jacket, gloves, and and, and over-the-ankle boots, and that's what I'm yeah. going to recommend for her. I'd call that fair, because yeah. I mean, if I'm going to get lunch here in the city, uh, I'll, I'll just throw like the two I do not ride without, helmet and gloves. Because it's like, if I'm going only 5, 10, 15 miles an hour to get to where I'm getting the food, the first thing that's going to I'm either hit is either my, he- my head or my hands going out on the deck. So right. I, I'd call that fair. The gloves is top priority to me, because... You only yep. have 10, 10 fingers and you ain't getting more after that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you know, non-riding denim is, you know, just sort of like sturdy pants uh, mm-hmm. that you already have is, is, is probably fair. Just, just know it's, it's um, if you're not familiar with what it feels like for your body to hit asphalt or concrete without armor. Uh, I don't want to say that you should familiarize yourself with that, but I think you should think about that before mm-hmm. you ride without without armor and i do i mean i I jump on a bike and i go around town sometimes but uh, but it comes to mind i think like you know a a knee hitting asphalt with no armor is no picnic but But uh, no no i I think that's a great point that we really have like i i wear different levels of gear depending on the kind of riding that i'm doing and i feel like i know myself at this point too right like 
if I'm just riding around town, I, and, I, and I can already see the people typing away on their keyboards, like disagreeing with this. <laughs> at get, at get, right? All the time. But like, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm riding less aggressively. Anytime I'm going out for a Sunday morning ride, where I know that I'm going to be riding possibly a bit more aggressively, then I'm automatically putting more gear on, and and I think mm -hmm. I relate it more to how I'm approaching the ride. And I think there's a lot of people that are probably typing away. They're like, well, you can't account for Johnny Suzuki out there that's going to hit you <laughs> in his, you know, rodeo. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the tough part is do, do as we say, not as we do, because I, I do it all the time. We go, if we ever go to an island or in the Caribbean or anything like that, I'm running a scooter, probably wearing shorts, probably wearing a short sleeve shirt and a, you know, a little rental helmet. But I know I trust myself at speeds. You know, I trust myself at certain riding capabilities, even with my wife on the back. But if I'm putt putting around the backyard on the pit bike, I'm not going to put everything on. I might put my helmet on, but I'm not putting everything on. Right, but right. if you and I yeah, head out to yeah. the pines or head to a rock you know, section, I'm putting every single thing on because the likelihood just shot through the roof of me crashing. Well, so. that ties right into Christian, who's yes, 37 years old. Uh, Christian's been riding for a few years, recently bought a dual sport, and is now getting into off-road riding. Pat, let's say Christian were to come out with you to the Pine Barrens. What would you recommend for Christian to uh, to use to start off with? Good for you, Christian. Welcome to the best section of riding uh, in the entire industry. Um, if you're going off-road riding and you know, you're know you just trying to learn how to... Did you say... I'm sorry. Did you say he was a beginner rider? This no, no. No, Christian's 37, been riding for a few years at this point. A few years. Okay. But okay. but doesn't have a, doesn't have a lot of off-road experience. Like, you know, getting into off-road riding. So not not a not a veteran, but but just sort yeah, of, you know... It's, just, it's uh, his first dual sport motorcycle. Right. Getting into off-road riding, but has been riding motorcycles on the street for many years. Yeah. Um, whew, that's tough because there's so many different areas. Like there's so many different types of off-road riding. Um, what I would say is at least helmet. I think everybody can agree with that. It's like you, the first thing you're going to do when you tumble over is hit your head. Um, but like, probably but say, does, does Christian need, if he's got a street helmet, does he need a dirt bike helmet to go riding at first? It's fair. No, not not really in my opinion. I mean, you're not going to have the luxury features of a dirt helmet, you know, ventilation, everything like that, or a peak visor. Right. But if you're just right. learning, you're just trying to figure out what you want. Um, okay. That's so fair. I, I'd say that probably just a helmet and maybe some chest and back protection. Just make sure that you're kind of protecting everything because your likelihood of hitting the handlebars <laughs> when you go over the bars or hit <laughs> something or run into anything a lot higher than any other sector and maybe yeah. some elbow and shoulder. But I, would, I, mean, I don't know. I, I'd be curious on your two um, opinions on that because I wouldn't even say boots. He's probably got a pair of Tims. I, I disagree with you. With I that. disagree with you 100. percent I think nice. boots. I think we got boots, a disagreement. I think <laughs> boots for off-road riding. Getting a good pair of off-road boots is the first thing that Christian should be looking at. Listen, I've seen people out there with a street helmet, sweating their face off and sweat dripping in their eyes mm -hmm. and dust wrapped around their forehead because they're trying to wear an RF 1200 off-road and it's miserable <laughs> but they're wearing the right boots and I, I i commend those individuals i i think if you're going to you know try dual sporting for the first time there's a lot that you can get away with um using carrying over some of your street gear put on your street jacket uh wear a pair of jeans but make sure that you are wearing a solid pair of of off-road boots i think that's the number mm. one area where people should start yeah, mm. that's I, I've, I I always go back to the same memory, and it was Dirty Davers 2018, uh, the local dual sport here in Pennsylvania, and I got passed on a hard section by a man who was raising hell and praising Dale uh, in <laughs> Tim's, a street helmet and a t-shirt and jeans, and he flew past me, and I think he was a local, <laughs> but that that man changed my outlook on what can be done. With but a, he with but, a good but shirt he was hands. probably mm, where he was probably been riding dirt bikes since his PW. 50 that his parents gave him when he was two years old and he shouldn't right. have been riding anyway. But I think for somebody like, like uh, mid-level riders that mm -hmm. are, you know, they've spent a few years riding on the street. They don't have any off-road experience. Um, switching to the dirt, if you've been riding on the street your whole life is, is, a, is a bit different. And I, 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 I do think that like, if, if you can start with helmets or you can start with boots, I do think an off-road helmet with a pair of goggles, it's worth its weight in gold for dust protection out of your eyes. The yeah. rest of it, the rest of it you can build from there. Zach, do you have yeah. anything that you want to disagree with me on? <laughs> no, it's interesting. I, I appreciate that Pat, the gear guru, guru said, uh, hey, you just wear yeah. some work boots out there, you know, go for it. And I, I, to a certain extent, if that was, if that for some reason was a barrier of entry for people, then I would say the same thing, you know, like go, go, go have, go have fun. Like go try your, your new uh, dirt bike and you don't need to go nuts buying a lot of gear. But 
I do agree. I having taken a cleated off-road style metal foot peg to the shin on Mm -hmm. more than one occasion. And, and I know that discomfort so well, I can imagine it right now, actually. Uh, I, I think that good, good boots would be near the top of my list for, for riding off road. Uh, And I think Spurgeon's right about the luxury of having a nice helmet. Um, and I think you, uh, Pat are very right to point out, um, chest protection. Um, and I think that, I think that the rest of it is, is, um, yeah. The rest of dirt what? bike gear is really not very expensive, and it's in part because there's not a lot of material there, and that's mm-hmm. in part because it's just it's sort of sort of for the look. Some of it, you know, yes. like off road pants I wrote, and stuff I, like that. I wrote I wrote an article about this about getting into adventure riding. I think people look at adventure <laughs> riding gear and think it's way too expensive. Get dirt bike gear. Dirt bike gear mm-hmm. is so much more affordable. And 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 the one thing I'll leave you with, and then we're gonna move on. Um, you know, when we're talking about dual sport riding or dirt bike riding gear. Oftentimes, people go out there and I see them using their street gloves. Street mm-hmm. gloves are not designed to be worn off-road because they're not designed for all of the clutch work you have to do. There's a reason that dirt bike gloves are like $25 and it's like a piece of cloth because <laughs> you are just clutching and braking the whole time in a way that you're not doing on the street. And oftentimes, you know, you get to an end of a ride with somebody that's doing it for the first time and they're wearing their their, their fancy street leather gloves and they've got arm pump and their hand is cramped and they're like, how do you do this? And it's like, oh, you just need like yeah. a $15 pair of uh, of offer gloves. So that's yeah, another yeah. another good point. I, before before we move on, I was very curious to hear because I know Spurgeon, you're very, very adamant on knee protection. And I, I was curious to hear that omission from you just because, I mean, you've hurt your knee before. We've both gone from dual axis, like uh, just knee mm-hmm. guards to knee braces. But you don't think a new rider should pop, pop those in? I think One of the two. Here, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to balance me saying you should ride with knee braces and my knee braces cost me $800. Yes. And that's not a fair recommendation to make for new riders. I do think <laughs> standalone knee guards that you can get for, you know, 70 or 80 bucks. If yeah. you're going to wear a pair of blue jeans, get a, get a $80, $70 pair of knee guards to put on with your, you know, $200 boots. And that's a great place to start. It's a great call out, Pat. I just walk this line of like, I don't want to be like, oh, you got to have knee braces on mm-hmm. because I didn't start with knee braces. I have yeah. horrible knee injuries now, but like yeah. <laughs> I didn't start with knee braces. It didn't prohibit me from going out and learning how to do this. Yeah, yeah. I think I have about 10, 10 friends that have used my old knee braces. It's like, don't go out and buy them. Don't, don't buy knee guards. Just use mine. See if you like it first and then try to get yeah. you know the approval past the girlfriend or wife that you <laughs> spend the money to go into off-road riding. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that, uh, you know, there's a, one of the reasons you guys are adamant about knee protection is that you are good enough and you ride hard enough that that's what you will hurt when you make a mistake. And I think that, you know, for Christian, 37 years old, been riding for a few years yeah. and is just dabbling in, in, uh, in off-road riding. There's, there's going to be a learning curve, right? Yeah. Doesn't, welcome, doesn't need Christian. to be kitted out. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Christian. Welcome. We, yeah. welcome. Hypothetical Christian. Okay. Well, th- th- we, we might be setting a world record for longest high side, low side podcast ever. Um, but hopefully all that stuff that Pat talked through and, and what we, what we chewed over, uh, with regard to gear is helpful. Um, and if it wasn't helpful, then maybe it was entertaining, although that's a little hard to believe. Anyway, we should move on to, uh, something that will surely entertain you, which is the rev trivia engine guessing game. Pat McHugh, do you know how this works? I have I have been briefly told, but no, I have no idea. Treat me as if I don't <laughs> okay. know what we're talking about. So what you're going to hear, and the audience will hear along with us, is approximately a 20 to 30 second clip of a motorcycle starting, revving a few times, and shutting off. Our our uh, goal, our mission, as these uh, the the three hosts of High Side Low Side this time around, is to guess the make model. Uh, year and any modifications we think we hear on this motorcycle. And none of the three of us, just for the listening audience's clarity, have heard this sound before. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it works for me. <laughs> let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, listening at home in your car, let's start our engines. Feeling. For those of you listening at home, Zach has just got his engine sound to work, so we're giving him a second to to <laughs> listen so that he can make his guess. Okay. Well, I feel 
Pat, what do you um, feel before Zach feels like okay, something? Okay, yeah, yeah, complete guest honors. That's true, that's true. I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Man. I feel confident, but I, I know that is coming <laughs> from a complete naive sector. of the, I only know the bikes I own. Uh, I don't like riding other people's bikes. I own many bikes, but I don't. I don't like riding other people's bikes. But I. I feel like I know what it is. What do you I, think? I like well, give us a give us. Yeah, a, what do you, what is it, it? Hit us. Is that is that the old uh, y'all go ahead? Uh, I'll catch up. The old KLR 650. Hmm. Is oh. that am I am I in the right? It sounded like a single. We don't know. Like we a, don't a know either. Single. So we're playing. Oh, with we don't you. know either. It. I think you're. It's definitely a single. It's definitely. It a only single. has one cylinder. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, that that engine sound has been drilled into my brain from eight days in the Mojave <laughs> Desert uh, of catching up to the rest of the group. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stake my claim there. I'll even go as far as maybe a 20, 2021 KLR six fifty. Oh wow! wow. Dang. <laughs> I can't uh, do modifications. I, though. I'll give that to I, you. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think that's a great guess. I I thought it was a smaller bike than that. Like I was gonna say Honda CRF three hundred or mm-hmm. or like a smaller single. But I'm listening to that starter noise and it sounds like a pretty burly starter yeah it's, yeah. it's not turning over yeah. quickly it's like that's, going that's rawr, it rawr. yes if you listen yeah. if you listen to the starter sound that starter is working to turn <laughs> that engine over um yeah. all right well here here's a hint uh the hint number one is this is a oh a 292 cc liquid cool okay. four stroke Okay, so I know, it, I know apparel guys. I'm not a bike guy. I, I, I need to. Uh, so a well, 292 cc liquid cooled four stroke. 292 cc. So I think new. I think a CRF 300 is a 286, if memory serves. So 292 could be a KLX 300. I was gonna say KLX is the other one I was thinking too. KL- the, KLX and Honda 300s? were the two that I was thinking of. But if you know, if you know the exact displacement of the Honda, that's more than I do at the top of my head. I think it's a 286, uh, and 292. I don't know what other. Well, I think hint number two is gonna help us narrow it down. So I just pulled the I just pulled the post-it note off of hint Japanese number two. Manufacturer. I've got a I've got one more guess before we get to hint number two. Go for it. BMW G310 GS. I was going to say 310 Jen's bike. But mm. I don't know. Is that a single? Is that That's a single, it's right? It's a single. single. Yeah. yeah. Well, hit number two is that it has a super moto ah, sibling. Okay. Yeah. So it is a KLX 300. The final hint of the day is that it was released as a new model in 2021. Ah. And this is a 2023 KLX 300 dual sport this is uh, Kawasaki sent in by Claude. Uh, All right. Claude Good said job, Claude. Cla- Claude's bike has no <laughs> modifications. It is bone is a bone stock 2023 Kawasaki KLX 300 Dual Sport. Um, so Claude, you have won a free T-shirt. Thank you for sending us your engine sound for playing See? the game. I knew, I knew it was a 2021 Kawasaki starter. You did. I you heard did. that you back knew there. It was I just, a you know, little off on the CCs. <laughs> I mean, jokes aside, they might have a, they might have a, you know, the same, same uh, starter motor that they use. Yeah. Who knows? I so, did stall um, a lot on that bike, so I know that starter sound. So. <laughs> <laughs> the time has come where we're going to kick Patrick off the podcast. Patrick, thank you for joining us. Zach and I have some comments to get into from the high side, low side listening audience. But for our time with you, we thank you. But we are ready to bid you adieu. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. This was a blast, guys. Anytime you want to chat uh, products, you know I'm happy to do it in length. <laughs> Word. Thanks for hanging out, man. See you later. Yep, see ya. So thanks to Pat again uh, for, for joining us. For, for those of you that want more information on gear, uh, Pat is the person that is constantly working with Jen and myself and Patrick Garvin to an extent. So you know whether you're at RevZilla.com or CycleGear.com or JPCycles.com, uh, all those product videos are curated and, and, and really researched for by Pat McHugh. So we, we try to do that as a resource for motorcyclists out there you know, that are trying to find the gear that's right for them. Um, and, and that's really where, you know, Revzilla got its start doing these videos that has evolved into, you know, Zach and I now get to sit down and have a motorcycle podcast. So Pat's <laughs> actually the person behind the research that goes into a, a lot of those videos that are out there. Absolutely. Yeah. And super knowledgeable guy. Great to have him on the team. Obviously very easy to talk to. Um, and if you do have more questions specifically about gear, um, feel free to send them in to high side, low side at revzilla.com and uh, we'll consider doing something like this again if we can cover different topics that would help you, the motorcycling public, understand it all better. 
All right, so let's get into, we have got a t-shirt winner and we've got one comment today. We only went with one comment because it ties into the, the theme of the episode, but also the next episode, episode 11, is our high side, low side season six comments episode. So we don't want to give right. away too many comments this time around, <laughs> but uh, the winner today who left us an Apple podcast review, uh, which we ask all of you to do. If you're listening, please leave us an Apple podcast yes. review. Helps people find the show, helps make the show better. Chuck N.H. wrote in and says, I feel a strong kinship with all the hosts and guests of High Side, Low Side. As a lifelong motorcyclist from Massachusetts, the stories of Zach Quartz and Ari Henning's early days at Loudoun are especially strong for me. Uh, the very first vehicles I saw lapping the track were sidecars. So in my mind, in my imagination, I figure that I must have been there to have seen Zach racing with his dad back in the day. These connections make me feel like I'm making the right set of choices in my life. I could have easily been on that show with you. I could be out riding and testing new motorcycles, talking about motorcycles. I could work at Revzilla. It could have all been mine. Instead, I watch from afar with a tiny bit of jealousy. You know what might help? A youthful looking high side, low side t-shirt. Help me restore my youth. Uh, <laughs> I will say that Chuck did say that he really kind of identified with us. And then when Zach mentioned that his dad was born in, was it 1953? Yeah. He, he was like, well, I was born in 1955, so maybe I'm more of a high side, low side father figure uh, than, <laughs> right. than, uh, than, a, than a host. But either way, Chuck, we're happy to have you alongside of us. Indeed. And we will, of course, send you that high side, low side t-shirt, which might not literally restore your youth, but it could help your psyche, it sounds like, <laughs> and we would love that. Um, and I appreciate your your note very much, Chuck. I um, I think I, I wonder who you saw riding around on sidecars in the early '80s there when you first went to Loudon and saw uh, racing there. I'm not sure who that was, but no, it wasn't me, uh, and it wasn't my dad. I don't think. Anywho, uh, that's a great note to get, and um, and we hope that you enjoy your your T-shirt, Chuck. Please do send your size preference and mailing address to highsidelowside at revzilla.com, and we will send you a heckin' shirt. What year was the first year you raced sidecars? How like, I know you, I know you were fifteen. But what what year would that have been? Nineteen ninety nine. There you go. Nineteen ninety nine. I think. Chuck. All right. So Zach, you want to take the high side low side comment of the day? I do. This comes in via email from Tyler. Uh, Tyler says, <clears throat> and I quote: "I'm very much an all the gear all the time type rider. Everywhere I go is a leather jacket with an airbag, earplugs, armored pants, motorcycle boots, gloves." As a result, though, I find myself riding less than I want to, given the burden and time of getting ready. Would love to hear more about how you guys manage your pre-ride routine so it's as efficient and quick as possible. Any tips? Question mark. You want to go first? <laughs> sure. Well, uh, speaking of my dear old dad, actually, he often complains to me about his pre-ride routine because now he has uh, hearing aids that he has to, uh, to, and he has glasses. So he always jokes about like, now I got, I go get ready for my ride. I got to take out my hearing enhancers and I got to put in my <laughs> hearing dehancers, and then I got to take my glasses off and put a helmet on, put the glasses back on, and that I'm, that's just my face. I haven't even gotten to my my body or my, <laughs> you know, his his hands or feet or whatever. Um, so yeah, it can be a burden to get ready, and as we touched on. Um, in this episode thus far, uh, we, I, I, well, I'm interested to see what Spurgeon has to say, of course, but my pre-ride routine definitely depends a bit on the ride. I mean, I went to, what did I do? I had a scooter around that I was testing for daily rider and we needed something at the grocery store. You know, my, my wife was like, ah, oh, shoot, I forgot to get the green beans or whatever it was. Um, can you run over there? And I said, sure thing. So I come out to, to spin over to the grocery store. I think scooter is perfect. Uh, I'll do that. And I put on riding shoes. I left the jeans that I was wearing. I didn't put on any riding pants. I put on an urban jacket, like a light jacket with elbow and shoulder armor. Um, I don't think it has a back protector. Oh, it does have a back protector. doesn't matter. Uh, short, quick gloves. I put on a three-quarter helmet um, with eye protection. And I don't even think I put on ear... I don't even... I didn't even put in earplugs um, because I was only going to go 30 miles an hour over to the store. It's going to be quick. It's five minutes away. Uh, so... I made my ride more accessible and easier because I compromised on the gear that I put on truth be told. And that's something that I, I'm comfortable with. And I weighed the, the consequences and I looked down at my jeans that I was wearing and I thought that'll suck a little bit more if I hit the ground 
wearing these jeans instead of my riding jeans with D3O armor in them, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a choice that I made. And was it the right choice? I, that's not uh, for anyone to say except me, I don't think. Uh, but but it did solve the problem to a certain extent. And I think it's a it's basically, you know, always a, a balancing act. Yeah, How about I, you, Spurge? I, I, I think that's it. I mean, Tyler, like, if you feel like you are in need of the leather jacket and the airbag suit and and the the helmet and and all of that yeah. to be comfortable then that's that's awesome and like that's that's what you need to 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 do unfortunately that does come at a cost of of time um and you know that's one of the things where i agree with you i think that it can almost be a deterrent to riding when you think about like oh i can just go out and hop in my car in my jeans and a t-shirt and flip-flops. Yeah. Not that I would ever wear flip-flops because I'm not a heathen. <laughs> um, but like, I think that the, uh, the the counterpoint to that is like to put on the, the gear, it takes an extra five to 10 minutes to get ready sometimes. And when you're yeah. trying to rush out the door, you, you don't have that time. I, I, I'm kind of maybe even a little bit more lenient than Zach. You know, I have a pair of, of, of rocker boots that I wear that are just kind of like my everyday boots, but they're motorcycle boots with a little bit of a lifestyle look to them. I typically find myself around town just wearing a pair of whatever jeans I'm wearing for the day. Um, and I'll throw on a motorcycle jacket, a pair of gloves, and, and my helmet. And and that's pretty much my go-to outfit. Yep. Um, yep. And that's not the same thing I'm going to wear if I'm going to go out on a Sunday ride with my friends. Uh, typically, um, I'm I'm wearing specific motorcycle pants for that and I'm and I'm putting on all the stuff and there's more get ready time. The only thing I would say Tyler as a recommendation for how to be more efficient with this is I've started keeping all of my gear, my motorcycle specific gear on a shelf in my in my garage in my basement which is a bit more climate controlled at this point. Um so I'll usually <laughs> run downstairs in my in my underpants. Um my fiance doesn't <laughs> mind. Uh, cause we're, you know, we're going to be married at this point. So she's come to accept certain things and that's just going to be, you know, what she's signed up for, for the rest of her life. Um, but then I'll get dressed, I'll get dressed in the basement where I think sometimes people will get dressed in their regular clothes and then they'll have to change into their motorcycle clothes. So maybe there's some ways that you can keep all of your motorcycle gear in one spot. Um, that might be a right. bit more efficient for you. But I do the think only, I, I think he makes a great point though that like yeah it does. If, you, if you're putting all the gear on all the time like there's there's some there's some time that's that's taken yeah. up there right 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 uh, he or she we should say he or she uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Tyler, Tyler. yeah uh, what were you gonna the say the only other thing I would say what's that I was asking what you were I cut you off what were you gonna say yeah the only other thing I would say is that keeping in mind the efficiency with which gear goes on your body is a valid thing to consider. For example, I have a pair of riding shoes that I really like that require a full lace up every time I like a standard pair of shoes. Um, and then I have a pair of riding shoes that I really like that have laces on the front. So they look like shoes, but they have a zipper mm -hmm. that goes down the inside of the ankle to the arch of my foot. Um, and so that's, that's kind of common in motorcycle shoes and the, the, they're both shoes that I like, but the one is certainly easier to put on. You just slip your foot in, you zip it up, boom, whammy, you're done. Um, same goes with, you know, I have a pair of sport touring boots that I really like. Um, and they're one of the things I like about them is that they have a shin plate. They've got a nice sturdy, uh, uh sole and heel and heel cup and, and toe protection. Um, but they just, it's this one zipper and one flap of Velcro and boom, they're on my, on my feet. Um, and so if you're looking at your gear and you, you think, man, it takes for flipping ever for me to lace up these shoes or these gloves are so cumbersome and annoying. And why are there three pieces of Velcro? Um, that's an efficient, that's a step toward more efficiency that you could make. I don't know if you're struggling with that, Tyler in particular, but, uh, certainly worth considering and analyzing because if the amount of time it takes for you to get dressed is annoying, then having stuff that's nice and efficient to put on is, is something you can shop for next time you're getting your gear. Yep. And I think it's, it's one of those ones where, um, everybody's a little bit different and it's okay to <laughs> shift your gear around depending on the kind of ride that you're doing. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just a matter of knowing the amount of risk that you're willing to accept. And that's something that we all take in day to day as motorcyclists. And I think that's a great place to round out this episode. Yes, uh, indeed. As far as, uh, what did we learn today? We we're going to have plenty of more, uh, listener comments to dive into in episode 11, uh, where Zach and I, We'll sit down and we're going to go through all the, the comments that we saved throughout throughout the season. Um, but uh, if you haven't already done so, you can leave us a comment below 
uh, on YouTube. You can always send us an email to highside low side at revzola.com. Yes. And uh, yeah, anything anything left that I might have missed, Zach, that you want to oh, throw our, out? Our, our reflection moment here. Spurge, I like this. Well, you made a reference earlier in this podcast. You you said something about uh, a guy driving a car. You said something like, oh, you know, Johnny so-and-so. And do you remember the car that you referenced? You said in his rodeo. Well, was I, that, a, I, no, I was that a reference to an Isuzu rodeo? Yeah, because I made the mistake of I said Johnny <laughs> Suzuki. And then I was trying oh. I was trying to think of a Suzuki <laughs> model. But I was like, I was like his rodeo, but you're absolutely right. The, the, it wasn't a Suzuki rodeo. It was an Isuzu rodeo. So I, I got I my, didn't even yeah. know that Spurgeon had such a, a colossal and encyclopedic knowledge and memory of, of weird 90s SUVs. But there you go, everybody. An Isuzu rodeo reference here on High Side, Low Side. Thanks but for I, that, Spurge. But I was trying to think of a Suzuki model. So for <laughs> anyone that can think of a Suzuki car model that they imported into America, that would that would that that's what I was really going for. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay. So, uh, anyway. Suzuki Samurai. That's what ah, you meant to say. Ah, the Samurai. Johnny yes. Suzuki and his Samurai. There you go. The Suzuki Samurai. <laughs> How do you... That's like a Geo... What was the, the little Geo... The Geo Tracker versus Geo -tracker. the Suzuki Samurai. Correct. And I think on that note, we can round <laughs> out this episode. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out this time on High Side, Low Side. Um, for Spurge, I'm Zach, and we will hopefully see you next time.